Evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting of September 6th, 2017, of the Hatfield Planning Board to order. We have uh, two public hearings on the docket tonight, and then a couple uh, uh, informal sessions uh, with uh, residents here in town, as well as a session with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission about some of our zoning bylaws. Um, we haven't been on television for a while, so to my right is uh, Mr. Paul Labby, uh, Paul Dostal, uh, okay. co-chair, myself, Bob Wagner, chair of the planning board, our newest member, Rick Bertram, who replaced uh, Brian Nicholas, who did not run for re-election uh, here last May, and Ron Sassi, and then Wilma Davis, our administrative assistant. So with that, um, I'm just going to... Uh, start with the first public hearing for um, uh, John Brown uh, on 3 West Street. I'll uh, read it, this into the minutes. A meeting will be held by the Hatfield Planning Board, Memorial Town Hall, 59 Main Street, Hatfield, Massachusetts on September 6, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. on an application filed by John Brown for the premises of 3 West Street, Hatfield, Massachusetts, Assessor's Map 224, Lot 31. Currently zoned business owned by the Zapka family, LLC, 73 Hyde Hill Road, Williamsburg, Massachusetts, for the purpose of opening a cafe in an existing commercial location in accordance with Section 3, Table of Use Regulations, subsection 4.6, Restaurant Seated, set forth by the zoning bylaws. And uh, if anyone is interested, the complete application is available for inspection during regular business hours at the office of the town clerk here in town hall. So for this public hearing, as well as the second one, um, I'm going to uh, ask the applicant to describe the project and uh, any specific requests or waivers that they're requesting of the board. Uh, there'll be comments from the supporters of the project. Uh, any questions on the project will be made to the chair, who will then engage the applicant as required. We'll then um, entertain comments from opponents of the project Again, with any questions uh, on the project made to the chair who will engage the applicant as required. The board will then ask uh, questions of the applicant or any of the supporters or opponents of the project as necessary. Uh, we'll then close the public hearing for this and the second one and when we get to that one. Uh, the board will then deliberate on the project during which time it may uh, ask additional questions of the applicant, the supporter or uh, supporters or any opponents. And upon completion of its de deliberations, the chair will seek a motion to approve the project with or without conditions to reject the project or to continue the hearing to a future date with instructions to the applicant. So with that, John, if you can uh, come up and state your name and describe the project to us. Do you have any uh, charts or graphs for us today um, other than what's in our materials? No, I don't have anything specific. Okay. Right. And John, which uh, microphone would you like him to use? Or pull up to this microphone, then here, John. And then, uh, so for the board, and uh, and then for the uh, folks that might be watching, if you could just describe the project and what you want to do there. Sure. My name is John Brown, and um, I'd like to open a cafe at Three West Street. Um, the project that I have uh, is. It's pretty basic as far as turning the current location into, uh, you know, a small restaurant, a small kitchen, and an ADA-compliant bathroom. Um, my my goal, of course, is serving uh, breakfast and lunch, and um, I'm not really sure what else to mention. It's it's. It's an existing parking lot. The building was there already. Um, all the renovations are just on the inside, not changing anything to the outside at all. This area of West Street is currently zoned light uh, industrial, light industrial, right? Um, which um, in our table of use. Um, 4.6 uh, with is uh, allowed with our uh, with our review site plan review um, 
So you said it's breakfast and lunch. Mm -hmm. So about how many tables, chairs are you going to have? Tw 20 chairs. 20? Okay. Yeah. I only have one bathroom in there. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, so you're expecting people to come in, stay a little while, or are you going to have like Wi-Fi there? Are you expecting people to hang out all day? Or <laughs> Yeah, the, the all-day part is tough because it's only 20 seats, but I would... I. We're setting up, a, I have an electric fireplace, some comfy seating, mm -hmm. so I want people to come in and enjoy themselves and relax. And, um, you know, I don't want it to be a, a fast-paced thing where I'm just pushing people out the door. I want them to really enjoy it. I don't want it to be a fast food joint. I want it to be, uh, you know, quality food and um, what, what, what are the atmosphere. hours? What hours do you plan to open? Um, for the public, it's six to two, but for Paul down the end, there, it's, it's five o'clock. Oh, five o'clock. <laughs> so six a.m. Six a.m. to two is my goal right now. Okay. I might stretch it out an hour, just yeah. mattering how much business is coming in, or and so forth. Do we know um, the Smithsonian? It's just a couple. Uh, they're right next door. Right next door. Yeah. Uh, they they're, they're seven. Do they get open at seven or eight? I, I think. I'm not sure. They seem to be open relatively early. Yeah. yeah. I think they're open about seven. Yeah. Um, do you ever anticipate wanting to expand to dinner? No. Okay. And. Um, I don't think I have. I don't think the space is. Sufficient. I don't think I'm personally ready for all that mm -hmm. myself anyway. But I don't think the space is big enough to have a dinner crowd. It's really small, and my kitchen is uh, suited for a breakfast and lunch type setup. Um, you don't anticipate trying to install a drive-through late, you know? No. How a lot of how, like all the Dunkin' Donuts have a drive-through, and then some of the independent places have have uh, you know started out. People come in, and now next thing you know, they they come back and they want to. But now they want to drive through to mm -hmm. keep up with the competition. I don't anticipate okay. that at all. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add on the project itself? Mm, I, I don't. I, I'm not really sure other than... So you'll have signage out in front. Um, I'm sorry, yes. The signs are actually coming in tomorrow. And... Um, you, there won't be probably any additional lighting than what's already there, right, on the, on the parking lot? No, I'm actually, we're, we're putting in um, floodlights that has a 180 degree um, span, and it will cover my whole parking area. But additional to that, I didn't plan on it. Okay, so those, these will be mounted on the building, yes. shining down onto the parking right. lot. Right. Okay. Yeah, because the way the parking lot is, the building... Uh, is here and the parking lot is is only on this side. On the, so the yeah, on the left side of it. Uh huh. We'll cover the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so you're taking over the whole building and all the real estate, right? No, no, oh, you're not. Good question. But the the back is the Zapkas. They have um, their mm -hmm. garden center still. Okay, so they're still going to be able to operate there, and you're going to have your okay and the right. business in the front. Yeah, and there's good there's a good amount of parking in there. There's enough for 20 spaces in there comfortably. Mm -hmm. It's a nice wide area. Are there any um, supporters uh, here, anyone that's here uh, for the meeting to support the project? Yes? Um, in partnership with them, so support them 100%. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else want to make a comment? Yes, I'm Erica Gates. I work at Stiebel Altron, and we're all in support because we're neighbors Thank you. and have increased opportunities for lunch nearby. It's good. Great. Thank you. Um, any other, uh, are there any opponents uh, here of the project at present? No? Okay. Um, so, um, do we have, are there any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a, I got, uh, what, what's the approximate square footage of this restaurant? Mm, 1,600. No. Pardon me? 1,600 square feet. I'm just thinking about parking. It says, uh, the rest of our terminals shall have one space for each 50 square feet devoted to patron use. Yeah. So the, patron use is, is probably less use, than the 1600. Yes. Yeah. I would say that patron use is probably, just a guess off the top of my head, seven or 800. It's like half of the space that oh, I have. Um, that's enough parking, 50 times.
Yeah, so if he's got 20 spaces, that's enough. Yeah, right? it's enough for his. You said 800? I would say so, yeah. One space for each 50 square feet. So that's 16 parking spots so he's got at 800. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then the sign, that's, that's what it's going to look like. Yes. You're not, you're not going to, are you take, you're not, they're still going to keep they're the, the garden theirs. center and you're yeah. just going to be. Okay. Right. That, that space up top is, was left empty for me to add my own. All right. Ron or Rick, do you have any questions for John? Nope. No. No. Um, what about trash? Dumpster. The, the dumpster itself is, is um, we plan on putting it on the left-hand side of the parking lot, um, which we have to put some gravel down first and so forth just to make it level. And then we're going to put a fence around it. This will be towards the back there or out in? Out towards the front. Is there a way to uh, screen that at all? The, the fence itself, you mean? Or? Yeah, or I mean, you're going to put a fence around it. Is there yeah. a way to screen it with some planting as well so that the dumpster isn't so obvious from, uh, from, oh. fo from West Street? I, I could definitely do that. And yeah. the Zap is. Well, there's a garden center right nearby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can make that disappear pretty easy. Yeah. 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 They have the great, garden center, right? they have great stuff there. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you're not changing the color or the the siding or anything like that of the building? It's no. going to be pretty much the way to. This is the old kitchen center, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It was it was John's <clears throat> mom's place before. The, the front yeah. end of yeah. this. Okay. So um, I'm going to close the public hearing at this point, officially close the public hearing, unless there's any other comments that someone in the audience would like to make, and then we can take it up. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll close this public hearing. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, so um, what's the pleasure of the, of the board? I'm all in favor. I, I, I think it's a good idea. An appropriate place for something like this to be um, out there on West Street. Yeah, I, I don't think it's it's not detrimental yeah. to that uh, to the neighborhood. It's probably a good addition to bring in some additional business and. Well, and as you stated, with Stiebel Eltron nearby, it'd be helpful for you all too. A, an easy walk. Um, they meet all the requirements as, mm -hmm. yeah. as set forth yeah. here. They got plenty of parking, signage is um, in compliance with. Yeah. So they're not they're not building some big monstrosity out there. They're already using an existing building. So can I get a motion then to approve the project as uh, submitted for um, a cafe at Three West Street, um, as stated in the notice of meeting. So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, well, so we have Paul making the motion and Ron second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, thank John. Thank you so much. Yep. See you all down there. Okay, yep. Five will be there. <laughs> yeah. This will be the new location for the coffee, <laughs> coffee Five. meeting, right? Five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we are a little early uh, for our second hearing, which is at uh, stated and posted at seven o'clock. Double D's still open. Yeah. So They're we can probably pick up. Yeah. Is Mark Hebert here? Um, why don't you come on up and we'll? Because you have a right of way discussion on a driveway. One for everyone. Okay. Can you state your yep. name and? Mark Hebert, 38 Plain Road, Hatfield. I've been working with Kyle. I brought up a suggestion. I was curious on putting in a right of way. I built a new home on my property 12 years ago or so, a little over 4,000 square foot. It's just too big for me. So I was thinking of downsizing my home. So I wanted to see if I could put a common drive in and I have over eight acres, so I was going to go out back and put another home in. Um, the 
the driveway entrance is 20 feet as it stands now up to my home. And it'll be 16 feet wide going out back. The front home would be sold off with a three and a half or 3.3 acres. And there'll be 4.72 acres left as an additional for the back home. I have know, about five outbuildings already built on the property. I do farming in town. So, and I have a potential 1.2 acre lot when I get old and retire, if this rolls through, to possibly if, if the board awards it to be sold off as a lot. It would seem, so this is, uh, the road here is uh, Plain Road? Yes. Yep, I'm lot 26. And <clears throat> you built your house way at the back? No, <clears throat> my home isn't built in the front. Uh, is in the front here? Yes. Oh, right here? Yes, that's my existing home I have now. So this must have been a pre-existing non-conforming lot, right? Because it only has 160 feet of frontage. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to be able to allow okay. the uh, properties, the additional houses in the back because you aren't going to have the right amount of frontage. Um, it was okay for the single family home as a pre-existing non-conforming lot, but to be able to get the other one in and then maybe even a third one would just, is not going to, not going to work under current bylaws. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so we still have another 10 minutes. Um, do we want, Lisa, do you want to, um, yeah, why don't we chat real quick? If we get to seven, we'll suspend and move on. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Well, as long as you can get to a microphone so that people can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, here, if you just pass them around. Um, last week, last week um, I received, um, I cannot approve your building application at this time letter from Kyle Scott, and he suggested that I attend the next planning board meeting, and here I am. Mm -hmm. um, if you read the letter, he, he says the, essentially the addition has all the appearances of a totally separate dwelling unit. And here are, these are the plans that were submitted for the application. I was here. For a building permit? Yeah. Okay. And I was here a year ago for an application for a two-family, which was turned down. And, <clears throat> and in, since then, which was last July, um, I've been working with Mark on just modifying the plan that it is now just a residential extension of the existing property. And I'm not sure why Kyle has asked me to see you all. Um, but I know, Mark, you, on my behalf, went to see Kyle. Do you want to share the discussion that you had with him? Yeah, I, got, I, I think from the letter, I think Kyle feels that it, uh, it could possibly be construed as a second dwelling. I mean, Kyle is here, yeah, so he can, yeah, speak no, no. For, he can speak for himself, too. Um, uh, as a second dwelling does require a kitchen, and this, this unit does not have a kitchen. So that was the presumption that this would not be a self-contained, fully, uh, fully self-contained separate dwelling, but would be an addition to the existing house. And that is the presumption for the building permit, that this is not a second dwelling. This is an addition to the existing dwelling. So how does the 
house connect to the garage right now? Is that a breezeway? Yes. Is it an enclosed breezeway? Yes. Okay. And it's heated. And so it goes uh, from there into the garage into then the... Uh, it's, it's one contiguous structure. So it's an addition to an existing building. Yes. That is not connected to living space, however. It's a closed breezeway. You have your primary dwelling, you have the addition, and you have your garage breezeway. It's not something I've asked Mark the same question in your career. How, how many times have you seen this? And I believe his answer was pretty much like mine was never. Yeah. So. It wasn't exactly never, but it was uh, slim to none. I have I have designed projects that were, were separate spaces apart from the living space. Whether or not you could construe them as being second dwellings, I kind of doubt it. Um, I have designed spaces like studio spaces and things like that that are not connected through directly through heated spaces to the existing dwelling. So I, would, I, would, I can't say that I've never done it, kind of. But. Yeah. But this is a bedroom. Right. A sleeping unit, a living room. Mm -hmm. It is not a studio. We're not, I mean, that, the plan came in as bedroom, living room. It's marked. You have a copy of it. Yeah, the plan is here. Mm -hmm. And that's the contractor. I said, there's no kitchen cabinets, no sink. I said, what's the office? And he goes, well, there might be some cabinets in that. And so this is where this came up. I mean, I have, if you, you're willing to approve it, I have no problem with it. I just think it's a very unclear ground we're getting into. And I'm for it in law apartments, so don't get me wrong. But our bylaw is pretty clear. So I think we need to address that bylaw at some point. And um, I came up with the alternative that uh, perhaps uh, uh, Lisa would file an affidavit when you know the permits approved that recognizes attached to the deed at the registry that this is not a dwelling unit, uh, separate dwelling unit, and you are not creating a two-family, something of that nature. At the registry. Well, if it were, it could be filed. It could be oh, filed. Okay. So, um, so actually, to your point, uh, Kyle, about uh, in-law apartments, we are working with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to look at the recommendations of the Housing Production Plan Subcommittee, sure. and that is one of the recommendations on their, um, of their, uh, that is one of many recommendations that they made for addressing housing, future housing needs and issues in town. So we will be doing that with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission with an eye towards making recommendations of our own then to town meeting for perhaps some bylaw changes. But that's, you know, that's a work in progress. We're not in a position to make a decision on that or even talk about that tonight. In fact, we're, we've got Pioneer Valley Planning Commission with us tonight, but it's on other uh, elements of our bylaw. It's two separate grants that we have with PVPC. So. Um, uh, so just so the yeah. board understands, I think where I was coming from, seeing you, I had already heard a case that was denied for an apartment. This does look like an apartment, or it certainly could be at some point in time. So I thought you should review it again. If you so move to allow it to move forward, I have no problem with that. Uh, maybe we can come up with an alternative solution, which would be a deed restriction um, for the present time. And then, should the bylaw change, um, the deed restriction could then be removed. Is this, I actually was not present for, uh, I was out of town when the other hearing took place. Is this essentially the same location as that previous apartment yes, proposal? Yes, uh, but about half the size. And that is as far as the budget can take it. Mm -hmm. The um, can I say something? Uh, yeah. Just in terms of the definitions for 
what constitutes a second dwelling. There are some definitions in the Hatfield zoning and in the the residential building code. Mm -hmm. So I just I'll just read those mm -hmm. to you. The the, the, set, the dwelling unit, as it's described in the Hatfield zoning, is one or more rooms providing full living facilities for one family. It's pretty mm -hmm. pretty short. Right. Not very descriptive. Um, the Massachusetts building code is a little more elaborative. It's pretty clear under the Massachusetts building code that this would not be considered a second dwelling. A uh, Massachusetts building code, a residential code, a single dwelling unit providing complete independent living facilities for one or more persons, including permanent provisions for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. Mm -hmm. um, the sanitation code also says that each dwelling unit, this is in the Massachusetts building code, shall be provided with a kitchen area, and every kitchen area shall be provided with a sink. So we're not doing any of this eating facilities. Right. So, I, and, uh, I, and I appreciate that, and by all means, Lisa and Mark, don't take this the wrong way, but we have a situation already on uh, Elm Street right now where someone uh, suggested that they were only putting in a bathroom uh, uh, for uh, their employees to use when they were at the facility. And, um, and, uh, and there was a space not unlike this office, and we have since discovered, because of a domestic dispute that resulted in the police being there, that there's actually a kitchen there now, and there's a bathroom there, a full bathroom, and people are living there. That happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and believe me, <laughs> I have been in every open house in Hatfield for the last nine months when it says five or more bedrooms. And do you know what I find? Little apartments. Mm -hmm. And that's an enforcement. That's a zoning issue. Right. Um, we don't, and it, but as we know, I mean, it's, it, you know, things can happen in the dead of night in terms of things coming in and right. going. I mean, there's more than enough people uh, that don't get the building, the necessary permits for, you know, things that happen after the fact. So. Um, I, know, we, I know it's yeah. an issue. Yeah. And we need to be, we're, we just feel like, particularly since this was subject to a previous public hearing, uh, and because of concerns and comments made by the public, um, that was rejected, as you well know. Um, so, uh, you know, people are going to notice construction going on here, and, you know, I, and you're doing in in anticipation of perhaps an in-law bylaw. That was part of the design. Right. You've got, I mean, this office, as Kyle has said, could very easily, quickly become a kitchen. That, that is yeah. part of, of the inherent design. Mm -hmm. But what I have submitted to the building commissioner is this plan. And this is the plan I, plan I would like to carry out. And because other people have skirted around mm -hmm. the law, for me, it's like my integrity mm -hmm. is a little bit on the line because of what other people have done. Um, and so I, I would, I would like yeah. that, you know, to be there. Um, I, I'm here saying this is what I want to do. Now, p my plan B is by next May, you may have implemented an um, an accessory mm -hmm. apartment. Plan C, in July of, 19, of 2018, I am eligible, eligible to be, come before you again and, and make the same request for a two-family. By right, I have that. Yes, you do. Right. And so it's not... Would you have the necessary par dry, uh, parking if it were to be a two-family? Excuse me? Do you have the necessary parking if it were to be a two-family? Uh, two oh, that was, yeah, that, there was no issue. Mm -hmm. The issue was anxiety in the neighborhood. Right. Can I take a giant step backwards? Yeah. When I proposed to you at that other meeting, will you not put a kitchen in there and everybody would have granted that thing and that would have flown through, why didn't you accept that at the time? If you're now going to put up a building without a kitchen in it, why wouldn't you have accepted it at that other time? Because I was pissed off. That's not good in a public well, meeting, Lisa. I, I mean, well, <laughs> but honestly, you know, I've had time to reconsider. And what are my priorities? Let me tell you. Um, the twins are now 13. 
and we have an acoustic guitar, a saxophone, a clarinet, and bevies of friends. And so I'm looking for to stay the grandma that still helps with mostly everything and just have a little physical distance. So I've made the compromise, no kitchen. And it's a little bit atypical, but if you look at how the, the house is situated, it spans um, all of the, the width of the property that adding on is very difficult unless it is behind the garage. A little atypical, but... Um, for this stone patio, I mean, that's it's just that's not an option to go back. And, and the cellar access mm -hmm. is right on right there. Mm -hmm. It would be an enormous expense to try and um, pull that off. Kyle, what are you looking for from us? I mean, this is obviously um, this otherwise wouldn't come before us if there's not a request to make it a two-family house. Well, or you, you, had, had, you had denied it. The, the uh, previous the family. Family, right. and that's yeah. why it's before you. Right. Um, it has all the earmarks of a two family, or as Ms. Berkham freely admits that she wants to create one at some point with this structure. Um, so I thought you should take a closer look at it. I mean, if mm -hmm. you feel it should be allowed, you know. Well, I'm not sure it's it's. I mean, we're not being so asked. So if she to, comes back in 2018, yeah. boom, you have the two attached structure now at this point, permit granted, mm -hmm. so to speak. So you're also giving somebody the tools in their toolbox to get to where they want to go when it was denied in the first place, if you, if you understand my point. By the time we come back in 2018, it's going, to be changed. Mm -hmm. it's going to be changed more than likely, right? because of what we're looking into. Mm -hmm. So probably pushing this off to that kind of time would be the best situation. Or there's ways to legally remedy it now just by filing an affidavit attached to the deed mm -hmm. saying it is not a two-family. We recognize it is not a two-family structure. Somebody but that would be worse than Lisa's situation down the road. You know, that would all that have to be, be taken off. off. You know, you would all have to be rewritten and taken off at that other point, right? Yeah. You yeah. could do that, though. You could take, you could change that. Yeah, you could. Yeah. yeah. But that ensures you from a, mm. uh, another 62 and a half Elm Street not occurring, mm -hmm. you know, where, where a kitchen does appear. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, everybody says, well, is zoning enforcement, well, good luck with some of that. You know, uh, you taking people to court. Trying, trying to shut down the house. We really should go into that other deal that we had at 7 o'clock. Right, and, yeah. But are we close to making a decision here? Uh -huh. Since we're just a few minutes past 7. I don't want to go much later. Since this is a publicly recorded yeah. hearing, mm -hmm. and if I state I have no intention of putting in a kitchen until such time that there is authority to do it. Do not do that. Got to be in writing. Yeah, you, you got to do it in writing. You can't, you, you know, it's a, I would suggest it in writing if you're going to do it, you know. Well, I have something in writing. You want my signature? Well, we're not sure we're going <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, we're not sure we're, we're going to buy the program at this point, you know. To, if the board wants to agree that an affidavit is sufficient, I'll issue the permit and she can move forward. If the bylaw changes, you remove the condition on the deed, and she's got a two-family. It's very simple. It's yeah. done in other communities all the time. I would be fine with that. I mean, otherwise, this meets your dimensional requirements and your setbacks and everything else. Right. It's pretty, pretty un, out of the ordinary. Right. So that's why I brought yeah. it to you. But truly, it's an addition. Yeah, yeah. that's property. what I think. Right. It looks like it's an addition yeah. to, if it's a if it's a duck, it quacks yeah. like a duck. It's yeah. a duck, right? Yeah. Okay. It but right. it's an addition to an existing structure. Yeah. If it were attached to the actual residence, I would when it was brought before you, I would have issued it. I just have structural problems with the way that property is 
I couldn't afford to put it, I couldn't afford to add on. I think we should state it's not uh, worried about you, it's, it's the subsequent owner. Yeah. That we're worried about. We believe you, but if you sell the house, <coughs> the subsequent owners could turn it into a second apartment. So that's why the deed description, yeah. the, de the deed um, affidavit, affidavit would, would work as an easement, so to speak. Yeah. It would be the town's interest in the property, you know, as far as. State that more clearly. It's like an easement. It would be the town's interest in the property, limiting it to a, to a one family. And as you progress with your. It would stay with the property. It would run with the property be like an easement. Right, but we could, but if we change our bylaws, that could be extinguished. Ex extinguished. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could be severed. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it is a question of while you fully intend in all likelihood to stay there, you could sell it and someone might buy it with the idea of and making, it a two making it a two family without us knowing it, slipping stuff in, go to Home Depot. I mean, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Okay. I can see your point. Because yeah. we just have to be concerned not only about what you're suggesting and proposing, but what then, say, a subsequent owner might do if it were to go on the market. You know, for things change. Things happen all the time. What if you hit the lottery and yeah. you wanted to sell the house? <laughs> Mark. From an architectural standpoint, anytime someone comes for a building permit, one could speculate about what the owner might do if he wanted to after the permit was done. Oh yeah, you could put a door here and a kitchen there, and you got a two-family. You know, so there's a certain there's yeah, but there's a there's a bit of a difference here because it was proposed as a two-family, and uh, there was you're just drawing you're just drawing a distinction because this resident came forward and wanted a legal permit yeah. to do what she wanted to do, as opposed to another person who might say give her the permit. Not, not care. No, Mark, uh, if a person came and wanted to hook a bedroom and a bath onto a garage far away from their dwelling space, I would certainly question that one also. Right, uh, this is getting a little more yeah. looked at because it was denied. Okay. All I'm saying is that there are ways to turn a single family into a two family that doesn't involve a detached two bedrooms. You know? Right, but I think um, if, you're, if you're willing to do an affidavit, I think we would, otherwise it seems to be an addition on an existing house. And then at such time that our, if our bylaws change and you wish to come back and have it reconsidered as a two family, then that would just, we would address it at that point. And I would work with Kyle on the language and, and doing that and move forward with what you've got. Okay, and where would the affidavit be filed? At the uh, Hampshire Registry. Hampshire Deeds. County Registry of Deeds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. thank you. Uh, our apologies to um, those folks that might have been here. Thank you, Lisa. Do you have this? That's yours? You can too. have that. And these. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll take up the hearing that was scheduled for seven, and my apologies. That's a good one. We got into this other item. So, um, okay, so we're going to open this public hearing is uh, Ryan Bovier here. Uh, application filed by Ryan Bovier, Pioneer Valley Indoor Carding for premises at 10 West Street, Hatfield, Massachusetts, Assessors Map 224, Lot 24, currently zoned business owned by Northampton Boys 4 LLC, Robert Raymond, manager. For the purposes of expanding the go-kart track to the eastern corner of the property between the building and the highway, the track would continue from inside to outside. Some lighting may be necessary facing back towards the building. The surface proposed is concrete in accordance with Section 3.0 Table of Use, Section 422, Amusement and Recreation, set forth by the zoning bylaws. So can you describe the project? Do you have any charts or anything you want to show us? Or? Yeah, so I'll get a, okay. This is a proposed uh, uh, potential 
track layout we're right now looking for uh, you know we're getting all the that's our rear lot line between the back of the building and the mass highway what is Bob the area in orange that Ryan has highlighted okay where he's proposing the track and um, it's considered to be same as parking lot surface so he can go zero lot line but this would be more to probably a design that would be acceptable for uh, his engineers to figure out. So where is um, where is I ninety one? I ninety one would be to the right, right of this. Of mm -hmm. the so it's area. like in here. Correct. So this gra this these bushes are the would it's be the bushes like a between buffer zone here. buffer zone between there. Okay. Fence and the pin for the uh, oh. Okay. And um, so so actually. Five and ten is out here, right? Okay. So there's zero setback on that. On uh, paved surfaces, yes. It's just a paved surface that he's putting out. So there'll be no structures out here. No. And so there'll be like big garage doors that open this, so that you can close it off in the winter and still have the indoors. So this would be mainly during the. Uh, be three seasons. Maybe. Three seasons. Realistically, we're not going to even run it as a daily thing. It's going to probably be more of like a Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday thing when we have more staff, just because more track, more staff, more carts. Um, I just, I don't think it's going to generate a ton more business. It's just going to offer us more flexibility and um, changing things up, making it fresh, and keeping it new for customers. And then this is your existing building. This is the existing. That's yeah. Okay. That's the way I help you back the right. Right. Specifically, my. So we're talking two separate tracks here, where it's going to be. So when you, when you come, you, you'll go on this existing track, and then it's going to go outside. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we'll open. You'll, yeah, but you there, there would be joined, which that track couldn't be operated separately from the indoor track. Okay. Yeah, because the only access to it is from from the, from the inside, inside right. through through okay. big garage doors. Right. Or We're not going to have a space outside to store yeah, carts right. or anything like that. It's that's not. So what is your plan for lighting? That would be the one thing, and obviously, is that something that you need to get cleared by the state, too, in terms of the lighting and how it affects 91, or? Uh, no, we already have existing lighting off the back of the building that's already been there since mm -hmm. the, the building was constructed. Uh, Ryan would just have to go to Mass Highway District 2, just to confirm for you know, the amount of lumens that will allow him and probably tell him to direct it towards the face of the building. So from the highway back towards your building. Correct. There's already a pretty substantial buffer of vegetation between the rear lot and the highway, and it's much lower. So there's not going to be any buffer out here. This is just going to be lined track, right? Or is there going to be bumpers and all that other stuff built out there? And there's nothing's going to be built. There'll be. Uh, we've gone back and forth on whether or not we're going to use, like in the corners, we'll put tires and stuff like that. Um, but I'd like to keep it the same as what I have. So they're removable. Sections, but the tires is. can be gone. Correct. Not put in the ground, staked <coughs> in the ground, just laid They'll on top of the ground. They're temporarily attached, and then they can be removed. Okay. So nothing's just no. So you're not really building anything. No, definitely not. And it will be lined, I presume, white lined or whatever, or however it yeah, goes. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna lay it out. It's, we're we're the ex expectation is we're gonna probably see some visibility. I want that to look really attractive. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's. There's a lot of positives about it, you know. Uh, oh, this this is paved parking, I presume. Here. Right. Then, then how do you? What's going to be along here or here to protect some yeah, somebody so riding a bicycle from riding uh, onto the track? We're already working with underwriting. Then we'll have to be secure fencing, um, obviously, so that people can't just stumble onto the right. track. Right. Yeah. Okay. That, that's all underwriting. Okay. They'll, they'll be dictating that. And is this already paved now? This area? No. Okay. It's just grass. Oh, okay. So it's be gonna paved? be asphalt. No, it's gonna be concrete. That's yeah. Concrete. Yeah, that's the thing that they say they can move the least. So I'm not, I'm looking for I don't want to get like frost heaves and stuff like that. So it has mm -hmm. to be relatively flat. There's no suspension with the go karts, so that's what's <coughs> inside now is concrete, right? I'd like to keep the track consistent. Concrete. So yeah. Well it's not gonna be <coughs> I'm not I'm not familiar with tire temperatures on a go kart, but I know from motorsport, you're going to have a cooler surface outdoors. Yeah. So yeah. what you're used to getting 
but we're heating. for adhesion. But we're transferring. We're not heating that space hardly at all. So this temperature outside is pretty darn close to the temperature inside. I Even might in the winter? 50, it might vary 15 or 20 degrees, but, I mean, when we're busy, you know, it can be chilly. People are wearing jackets, and, you know, they're coming in properly dressed. Not necessarily to go skiing, but, like, to right. come properly but, but dressed. But this isn't going to happen in the winter anyway. There's a very, unless we get a... A Christmas like we did last year, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. You know, I think it was February. How about if it, how about <laughs> if Ryan, it starts what are your to rain? Do? Would you would you close it off? Oh yeah, rain. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and, we, and it would be it would kind of go off. You know, it wouldn't be this exact it same. It would be height, challenging. So that's for sure. I, I think there's a lot of fun things that can happen from there. Yeah. <laughs> what are your hours now? Uh, mostly either 11, 11 a.m. seven days a week we open. Uh, either uh, 8 on Sundays, 10 during the week, and 11 o'clock Fridays and Saturday nights. Run that by me one more time. I'm old. Sorry. I'm old and slow. Yeah, so 11, seven days a week yep. uh, open. Uh, Sundays we close at 8. Um, yep. Fridays we close at 11. Saturdays we close at 11. And the rest of the week is 10. And that's not going to change? I, no. That's been this five is years. to the back of this building and near the highway, so yeah. it's pretty far away from any yeah. uh, other businesses. I guess your businesses are the closest. And then the, uh, the uh, area next door where the River Valley Market folks park their cars, right? right. And then the, uh, the paint place is out of business. Is, is over there, but they're, they're long gone by those hours. Oh, yeah. And then the uh, nearest residence is probably the one that's uh, to the uh, looking at the Smithsonian, two houses over, and that's pretty far away. And blocked by buildings. Yeah. So you can't see it from. Yeah. Um, so are there, um, actually, do you have anything else that you want to present to the board about the project itself? Are there any supporters of the project here in the audience that came to specifically comment on this project? Um, any opponents? Stiebel Eltron, you're a neighbor. I know, I'm so not familiar with it. <laughs> 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 I'm sure guys we can, you know, I, I would comment, but I... I It'd be uh, outside your business hours anyway, probably. Yeah. If you don't hear the highway now, opposite. you probably won't hear them either. I think we're on the opposite. You're on right. the opposite side of the street. Right. We were at the, um, yeah. Otherwise, I would have had a conversation with Frank. And I would yeah. say, okay, what do you think of this? I'll be here. And anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, but sure, why not? I, mean, I just have one more question. Has this been done before somewhere else, indoor, outdoor? A couple of different spots. We'd be pretty much the only place on the East Coast doing it. So for the ability to... I don't have the largest track in the world or the fastest track, but we're going to have something that's going to set us apart. Uh, and with some corporate competition coming, it'd be nice to be able to have our own thing that we get, that we do that nobody else really does. Everybody's saying we're bigger, we're faster, we're this, we're that. And nobody's going inside or outside. Mm -hmm. A lot of people kind of find that interesting. So it would be, you know, I mean, from somebody that does it regularly, I'm like, I think it's great. But other people that don't do it often, it's a pretty cool, unique thing that, it's going to, I hope, draw people or draw repeat customers for us. You yeah. know. Well, it will make for a longer, regardless of it being indoor or outdoors, you're going to have a much longer track and much yeah, longer I mean, racing. The experience and the length yeah. of time. Yeah. yeah. And if it generates, you know, more people at a time mm -hmm. on weekends, on our busier times, less wait times, we can right. run more people through, potential <coughs> more profitability. That would, all those things are obviously positive. Hopeful. I mean, is there somebody? out there who regulates like how many cars you can have on a track at a time and all yeah. that i mean is there you know you know one one adult for every 10 kids i mean what's the uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can wonder sometimes but no it, it's it's more a matter of like the the way that we run it we we run far below what you should run i mean we could work we're, we're able to run about 12 um based on the width of the track the consistency of the width of the track the way that it's designed now we run eight nine occasionally and then 10 for like when it's like really competitive groups that are 
that we know how to manage because we have track officials. Having but. been in the insurance industry for many years, years back, his lost history is impeccable. Mm -hmm. But we, we, that's really important. Mm -hmm. We look for experience. Like I said, we're not the biggest or the fastest, so we have to do something. And if we can give you a good experience, hopefully, and that's not for everybody, but you know, that's the idea. So we run a lot less people than we than we technically should to keep the experience better. Mm -hmm. And again, we, and we as the landlords, our our policy is tied in on the liability side. So we wouldn't condone this if he had had loss history issues. It would just give us greater, greater exposure if there were problems. Are there, where's your closest competition? Are they mall now? Oh, so they have one and have it. It's not exactly the same, but marketing world, it, it is. Um, that, that's all obviously indoor. That's totally indoors, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. This, I mean, it's they do electric carts, we do gas. You know, it's like I said, completely different. They're both go karts, but they're a uh, different product for sure. Where's the next one closest to you, Connecticut? The ones that would be comparable to us, yeah, a Wallingford, Connecticut, or F1 Boston, Braintree. Um, everybody's opening up big electric car facilities, and they just people that are looking for the experience. They see them, but they're like. It's just different. Like I said, it, people are coming as an enthusiast to do something like we do, and the new person. But um, it's just, it's special. I think what we're doing, the place in Connecticut, Boston, and us, it's, you know, it's. Uh, well, Laconia still has a big one, don't they, up in the, the far yeah. end? Laconia at the Man. drag strip? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, oh, no uh, on, on the road, on the strip going out to Meredith from. <clears throat> Laconia, they have a cart track in the back there. They might, but it, I bet you it's probably out, outside completely. An outside track, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I bet you it's probably close. All the ones in New Hampshire that I've seen lately, Keene area, stuff like that, they're all, there's no money in it. You know, the ones in, in uh, 202 Sports in, uh, in Orange, I mean, you've got to, you know, you have three months to make as much possible money and then you pay for the rest of the nine. You know, if you don't own the property, so it's really. They hard. had a lock up there. The three months was a lock in Laconia. You know, oh. I mean, they had. There was three months, so and that and in? that three months was packed in there. You know, there was no. They have to, yeah. yeah, they had. They got it. They yeah. had it there running. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if there's no comments from the audience and you don't have anything else to add, I'm going to close the public hearing, and then we'll deliberate on this. This is a site plan review. Um, request just so it would be approval of a site plan. Um, it's uh, allowed in the business zone, so it's an expansion of an existing commercial activity in town. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the board or questions of the applicant uh, from the board? Uh, hearing none and hearing no uh, opposition and uh, seems pretty, um, there's no additional building or structures. You're not going to cheat your, your signage will be the same out on the, you may include something or to include the indoor, outdoor, you have to change your name. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, can I get a motion to approve the uh, a site plan, uh, the proposal for the uh, expansion of the indoor carting to include this outdoor area? Um, and what is the, um, actually, what is the exact dimension of the area that you want to, uh, this is all on your, all within your property bounds. Right. And so do we know what is the actual the square area foot? The back of the building is approximately 20,000 square feet. And I believe the area that he's proposing for the track would be about 50% of that. Okay, about 10,000 square feet. Right. Yeah. Are there any, um, this is, would not be under uh, necessarily our purview, but is uh, any uh, intermittent streams, wetlands, anything? Do you need, you need to go before a Conservation Commission? It's already been done. Okay. Any other comments or questions? We have a motion to approve. I have a motion for it. And second? I'll second it. Okay, seconded by Paul. Any additional discussion on the part of the board? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, then it passes unanimously.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your yep. time this evening. Yep. Good to see you all. Good to see you. I didn't know you knew anything about insurance. Brian, do you want this back? <laughs> well, you can have this one. Oh, here. I have, this, I have a complete, so if okay. you just want to add it to yeah. the files. No, that's right. You, it's you want just one not Wilma? colored. In. Wilma has one, right? Yes. We have Wilma. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll keep it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Yep. Tom, I guess we can, you're next on the list. Oh, this? So soon. Yep. So soon. Because <laughs> we have, we've met with Mark, Lisa, Tom, we've done the two hearings, and then we'll meet with uh, Corrine, Ashley, and Larry on our uh, open space and TDR development bylaws. So, okay, Tom. Great. So thanks for letting me come in tonight. Uh-huh. Um, I've been in contact with Wilma and... I understand that you had all the information. This is this is a follow-up from what we started a year ago when we uh, found out about the uh, the zoning change. And thanks to you and the rest of the town for allowing that. So if there's any other concerns uh, uh, that have to do, I, we, we went over the site plan a year ago. And... Uh, at that point, the, the stop was the, the zoning, so. Right. And I'd like to. You are going to, this is going to require a public, a formal public hearing. Okay. With notice of your, uh, uh, your neighbors and such, because you have, um, so we've, uh, we've expanded the business zone, um, and this is a, uh, this is a warehouse facility, right? Correct. You, that's what you're going to be doing there? Um, New building, 60 by 138. Yeah. That's right, yep, yep. <clears throat> and uh, so, um, Tom, why don't you describe the building really quickly while I'm just, I just want to confirm the. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's that, we've got that large metal warehouse um, that's a, uh, Roughly 75 by 125, and this is an, a 60-foot addition to the west uh, that just mates right up to that to that building. It'll, 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 it's an addition. It's an addition. So, is it fair to uh, describe this as processing or warehousing of agricultural products? Because you're going to right. So that that uh, in a business zone does require a special permit and site plan review. Okay. So, um, you know, while the, the addition may seem fairly straightforward, um, it does require our uh, review under special permit and site plan review, which would then require a public hearing and noticing neighbors and, and the such. Um, Is there anything else you need besides what you have that we brought in a year ago? And how soon could we do that? I mean, is that a... I, 30 day process or I am um, I think you should be prepared to answer questions about a complaint that we had regarding rinsing and use of water at your facility okay. there was an abutter who uh, I'm on the Conservation Commission and he didn't come before me he came before the planning board so I just thought that you might be want to address that sure. at the public meeting and there'll be, uh, in all likelihood, questions regarding the, um, the, st the, ad the additional tanks and storage facilities that you have there that have gone on in the last few years or so. Um, which is they've, curious. Been, they've been in there about maybe less than 10 years, but and yeah, at least eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, just fine. Uh, Building permits for those to install them. Uh, the building inspector at the time, we invited him when we poured that concrete and laid that all out. And um, I almost, I, I can't remember if he issued a building permit or said one wasn't required. But we can do the research on that. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Because it, because there's no structure there. Yeah. 
I have a curiosity. What's in what's in those tanks? Those herbicides, pesticides? No, no pesticides at all. Only fertilizer. Seasonal use for liquid storing, for liquid so fertilizer. Liquid fertilizer that yes. you then put into the into the little tanks that then get delivered to the farms. Correct. Um, so. Um, and there's two water tanks in there also. So it would be. I think in anticipation of the public hearing and the fact that we have heard from uh, an abutter um, about some concerns, it would be, I think, useful for you to have some kind of uh, sort of a, a roster of what you have out there and what's, it, and what, and what's contained in those and what, what goes on there. I think okay. as the area has grown um, from agriculture to even more residential than it was. I mean, with the uh, Elm, Elm Street Hatfield Village mm -hmm. uh, nearby, and then the over fifty-five. Yeah, that, that's the over. Yeah, that's the Hatfield that Village, and, and the other one. And then the uh, the additional uh, development on Sunset Drive and on uh, what's uh, Scotland, Road. Scotland Road. There's just yeah. you just have more neighbors. That's all. Yeah, so yeah, I'd be glad to go over what we do there and how we do it. That's. I think that'd be that's fine. So, so not not so much discussion about the addition, but what's going on on the rest of the site. I think so. Yeah. But well, there so. would be both if someone has a question on that. Also, right. You're gonna have yeah. You're gonna have to answer. Yeah. Because it 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 is connected to it. Will the new building, as a result of the new building, does that mean there'll be more tanks in the future? What does this mean in terms of expansion and your activities and so on? So, um, but yeah. So I would get together with Wilma on the scheduling and all of that. Um, but it will require a public hearing because of the fact that we need a <coughs> site plan, uh, a special permit and site plan review. What, what's the timeline on that? We need at least 30 days from the put an ad uh, publication to the hearing. And <coughs> probably should be another five, six days, work, uh, business days. To prepare everything and get in place. So is that going to line up with the October meeting? For Probably it'd be tight on the October meeting, but can't do it. This is September sixth, and that's October four. Mm -hmm. So it fall over into November. November, yeah. Mm -hmm. Be more comfortable for you. No, it's hectic. Not getting it together. This can be a metal building also? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. I'll be prepared. I'll okay. get together. We'll get that posted. Yep. Great. Do the best we can. Um, okay. Ron, do you see anything on here that they need to, in anticipation of their, of their uh, submission? As far as CONCOM goes? No, as far as just the uh, this plat plan. I don't, you know. Oh, oh, no, I don't see anything. Okay. Um, there might be a tie to the nearest street. I mean, it just says Elm Street. Normally, um, uh, a plan should, you know, <laughs> nail it down better as far, as far as just Elm Street, maybe a, a tie to um, Sunset. Oh, you mean the side street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mean just defining how far it is over there? Yeah, to help to help uh, situate it on Elm Street, a tie to the nearest street helps do that. So um, that's usually in the um, Mass General laws for us for a uh, property survey is to gotcha. have a, a tie to the nearest street. So you'll, like, something a little more detailed than just, yeah. Just again, a tie to Sunset or the nearest street. Yeah, Sunset probably is the nearest street. Yeah, yeah. So the better orientation as to where it is on Elm Street. Right now, it's it's on Elm Street, but that's yeah, just, that's it. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We'll get together. All right. Thank See you. See you in six weeks. November. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Good night. All right. So, uh, yeah. Um, I think that you should check to find out, Erica. Are yeah. you hoping to meet with this board this evening? Oh, okay. You're okay. just visiting us. Yeah. All right. Just want and, to make sure. Uh, so we, the next item on our agenda is to meet with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission folks about, we had asked them to look into our 
transfer of development rights and our open space development bylaws and give us some insights as to how we might improve those uh, going forward to see more additional use on both of those. Um, so are there other, Stephanie, are you here for something? I, I, there's other folks here that I'm not sure. Stephanie was invited. I invited her as a member of the Hatfield Housing Committee. OK, all right, OK. Just to keep her okay. in the loop. OK, great. All right, and you are? Um, we were looking at a house at 73 Main Street, and the realtor said, come and see what goes on, because there's some strangeness about the property uh, boundaries there. <laughs> Oh, you're the one who wants to put in the wood shop? Well, we thought about, well, what if? We're just exploring the options before we do anything about it. But there's and, and have you talked to the uh, building inspector yet? Well, we haven't put an offer on it. No, but have you talked about to the building inspector about putting a? No, we just, uh, she brought it up. We, we were asking about what are the restrictions on the use of that little bit of other land? It would be really nice if we could work out a deal with our diocese of trading land, but I understand that the... It's going to be a, a business? Is, a artists. business? No, no. He Art wants to put personal in a, use? Yeah, he wants to put in a, a, a shed. And a, oh, a, a, I see. A woodworking. Woodworking building or facility or... Like a garage. Or garage, something right. Something like that. Yeah, a studio almost. I would meet with Kyle. He's here. He's downstairs. Building just inspector. Building inspector, just to get a sense from him. Yeah, this is, so this is the, uh, this is the, the um, if I remember, this is the actual rectory. Right. And then it wraps around the church itself. Well, it wraps around the parking lot. Oh, it's it's a parking lot to <clears throat> enough off it's from the rectory. To mm -hmm. Okay, so the parking is what is this thing in the center. Yeah, it separates. I'm not sure why it was done. And so. so see, there's a, the property. This property to the house goes all the way around the... Oh, yeah, because I yeah. think that doesn't, doesn't this go with the church? Remember the... Yeah, well, this... There's a big parking lot. That goes with the church, I think. I thought... Yeah, because that's on Day Avenue. I mean, that, this is Day Avenue. Here's Main Street here. Yeah, and that's the church, right? Yeah. I thought yeah. this went with that. Yeah. The reason that property was done like that was to get the square footage for that parcel of the rectory and break it off from the and diocese that, that, owning the property. That was the reason for the way it was cut. The parking up. lot part of the church? Yes, it was. Yeah. The whole thing was one. Yeah. But to get the get required a, square feet for yeah, the house. Yeah, to get a required square footage for the building lot to sell it off, they had to make those arrangements. Mm -hmm. What are the restrictions on somebody putting a, something right behind the existing, where the rectory is right now, uh, having a neighbor in that parking lot or something? Well, that depends on what happens to the church, who buys the church. Yeah, so that's and then you have to deal with that as it comes. I mean, that's a... That's why these are all affecting decisions of whether we're interested or not. Mm -hmm. so that's sort of the planning issue. Sure. Well, there's enough road frontage on the parking lot for there to be a house. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if it's dimensionally correct, but there's 419 feet. Yeah, there's there's a, yeah, there's a, yeah, she's got 200, I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. So I would go and talk with Kyle first downstairs. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you've got the setbacks and everything and you're putting in a studio, you know, whether it's whether you're painting in there or whittling wood, I mean, that's, you know, it's not a commercial activity. It's more... Oh, yeah. It's more of a setback issue and whether or not you want to walk around a parking lot to get to it. Yeah, right. I would think so, yeah. Okay, all right, yep. So, and, you're, and you are then, uh, you are on the housing committee as well? I'm Corinne. Oh. Okay. Oh, oh, you're Corinne. oh God. okay, well, come on up. <laughs> Ashley's here. You get an update on the 
review of the housing production plan. Oh, good. Okay, great. There's a lot to talk about tonight. So packets of information for all of you. Which I'm sorry I didn't get out of time. And I must say, the chairs back there are much more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> You can bring one up, Larry, if you need to. Thank you. They're on wheels. <laughs> so Wilma is going to leave, but we're still taping, so we'll be able to get notes and everything. So, all right. So, Corinne, why don't you, um, because we've got, who's going to MC here? Are you, Corinne? We're going to let Corinne start off. Okay, so can you just introduce everybody uh, to, to our tele television audience and, uh, and where you're from and all that? I'm Corinne Meissenlens from High Near Valley Planning Commission, and I've been working on uh, a review of the open space and transfer of development rights bylaws. This is Ashley Eaton, also a planner at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and you can say what you've been working on, Ashley. Uh, I'm looking at Hatfield's affordable housing density bonus, which is in the mixed-use overlay district. Um, and an inclusionary zone and bylaw. So, providing some updates tonight. And where with Larry Smith? Uh, Principal Land Use Planner, PVPC. Uh, worked on the board, prior members for a number of projects in the past. Um, and I'm here this, working with Ashley and Corn on these projects. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so actually, Ashley was going to start us off. Um, our projects dovetail in a lot of ways. Um, so she was going to start off with an um, a, a overview of development trends in Hatfield, and then I will go into my findings from there. Okay. Right. So in the folders that I handed out, you have a slideshow presentation mm -hmm. that will have some of the chart, charts for development trends. I think it's important to set the stage because we were tasked with figuring out why people aren't taking advantage of these mm -hmm. incentives. And so it's like, first of all, like, what's happening in Hatfield to begin with? Um, population has been pretty stable since 1990. Um, gained maybe 100 people over 15 years. And projections um, by the UMass Donahue Institute actually project Hatfield's population declining by 2030. Um, so that's something to think about. I think when you think of housing, we're finding smaller household sizes. So the number of units that might be needed will still increase, even though your population is potentially declining. Um, looking at assessors' data, uh, we wanted to get an idea of what buildings have gone up in Hatfield. This is not building permits. It's buildings that have been added to the tax rolls. It was the best data that we could get. Um, one question that we had for you, so when I saw the declining trend, we initially thought like the recession, but really buildings in Hatfield started to decline in 2003. And so I was wondering if you all had some insight onto why that might be, if something in your zoning changed or maybe the taxes went up. I'll let you ponder that. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Lavi, we were uh, building lots went out of sight. Price of mm -hmm. building okay. lots. Days up. I mean, it went from, you know, 59, 69, 79,000 to 139, 149. So they're around 50, uh, 150 now? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so they're like 150. So uh, it just, the bottom dropped out of the market. Okay. You know, I mean, you got to, once you, once you buy a building lot for $159,000, yeah. you're not going to put a yeah. 9,000 square foot <laughs> ranch on it. You know, uh, you're, you're now into the $500,000 stuff. So it's... Uh, yeah. I mean, if you got 150 in the land, you got to be yeah. 350 right. in the house. So that's what stopped it. Mm. But they are similar to Hadley. Yeah, but Hadley's got a different, a different vibe yes. than Hatfield. Does, <clears throat> Very okay? much. You know, it's a whole different vibe over there. Yeah. I was on this committee, by the way, that that put all this together for a year. You know, yeah. and um, it was heart wrenching when you get down to the end to not come up with an answer of any sort. Yeah. Okay, it was. There, there was answers, but there wasn't anything concrete that said, look, if we do this, this, and this, we'll be able to make it work. Yeah. Until some, I'm not going to take a lot of time here, but until <laughs> some of the major property owners either pass away and it gets subdivided down to where we can get it, and maybe, maybe just maybe, some zoning in smaller lots. Don't forget, we're at 200 by 45 thousand and then 200 by 60 thousand that bites up a lot of land so there's some changes can be made to make it better yes okay 
Um, the chart at the bottom is, is similar, but it, it breaks your buildings that were developed into land use categories. Um, I don't think it's terribly shocking. Most of the buildings that went up between 2000 and 2014 were one unit residential structures. Um, there's that. Um, looking specifically at residential units to see what type of units were um, single family or multifamily. Um, there were a couple of years where almost as many single family units were built as multifamily. Um, but I think it's still like a two to one ratio. Um, and then what I thought was the most interesting for my piece of research is when we think about affordable housing sale prices, so in order to meet that threshold of being affordable to individuals, it's a mortgage of about $185,000. Um, when you look at the assessed value of homes that have come online since 2000, um, the lowest one was about 210000 The highest was 800000 with an average of almost a half a million dollars. Say it again. So it's going to be, that's, I think, that's the, that's the, to get a housing, to get a unit <clears throat> at 185000 is going to be really challenging. And I think it was, of all of the assessed values of the land for those structures, um, I think it was 70% were more than half of the 185,000. Does that make sense? So if yep. you were thinking keeping so, your land costs yeah. below half of what yeah. your mortgage would be, very few lots. So right that affordable there. housing uh, sale price is what the state would consider to be for the area median income at, um, at yeah. what would be affordable. So that would put yeah. you, that would make it count towards your 10%. Right, yep, yeah. yep, and that, and those are, uh, and that, the, that, uh, that income level is different if it's a single uh, individual, a couple, or yeah. a family of four, or whatever. Yeah. Of a family, of four. family of four, okay. Uh, so those are just some basic trends that I think were important to help set the ground. You have a map in your packet, it's the same one as this big one, and that starts to look at um, where buildings were developed in the last 14 years, what the underlining zoning was, and whether or not it has access to water and sewer. Um, as just a way to, what's getting built where. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I was hoping we were going to see sort of like, look at this one node of development, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's all kind of just spread everywhere. Yeah. No patterns. <laughs> no rhyme, no reason. <laughs> Although I guess most of it is on, no, maybe not. I was going to say most of it served by sewer, but that's false. So that sort of sets the groundwork. Corinne's going to talk a bit about her TDR and open space development. Then I want to touch base on the affordable housing density bonus and the inclusionary zoning. I will be back again. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can work through all of this. Okay. And you'll be uh, working with us on the, the sort of set of recommendations that were made by the housing production plan as to some of the other items that are in that list. I mean, like we had this conversation tonight about in-law housing and... Um, yeah. So my project right now, like mm -hmm. I'm specifically funded to look at two... The inclusionary zoning. And the, yeah, and the density bonus uh -huh. in your housing okay. production right. plan. We can explore mm -hmm. other ways to get some of that work done. Okay. Uh, All right, great. Thank you. All right, Corinne? So my project um, is much smaller in terms of uh, time that I have to spend on it than Ashley's. So... Um, just off the bat, want to let you know that this is a draft of a final report that we will be giving you. And um, after this meeting, I have a few hours set aside. If you all have any questions or concerns or comment, I can certainly incorporate those. Um, but the project in and of itself is winding down. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what we were able to come up with is a overview of the transfer of development rights bylaw and the okay. open space development bylaw. Um, and determine um, what we thought might be barriers of use uh, or barriers to developers using these programs. Um, 
outside of the general development trends, which Ashley has already spoken to. So um, just going through, you know, starting from page one, I'll go through the findings. So um, are we looking at this? Yep, so we're looking at the, the, uh, okay. yep, the bold-faced uh, cover page. So um, mm. initially, Larry and I came for a meeting with you, and we spoke with the planning board about your thoughts as to uh, what was being developed and where and why development in general might be slow um, in Hatfield. From there, um, we moved into, I've spoken with uh, two, we've managed to get two developers on the phone um, to talk to them about their experiences and if they've considered using these bylaws. Um, one of them was a residential developer and the other one um, seemed to do a little bit of both, but we mostly spoke to her about uh, commercial uh, or light industrial development that she's been working on. Um, and uh, then I've done a, a pretty thorough review of your two bylaws and case studies and model bylaws from Massachusetts and comparing what you have here to what best practices are. So in general, the suggestions um, for general improvements that we've found for the transfer of development rights bylaw include identifying barriers to developers using the transfer of development rights bylaw, determining appropriate incentives for participating in the TDR program, and removing obscurities in the bylaw, and then for the open space development bylaw, um, we also found uh, that we should maybe look again at what appropriate incentives might be to encourage developers to participate in that program, and then further removing obscurities in that bylaw. So um, just to uh, tie in what Ashley spoke about uh, in, in relation to these bylaws, um, Development in general in Hatfield has been on a downward trend since 2001, and from the data that we had access to from MassGIS, it seems as though there have been, so now we're, sorry, now we're moving into the transfer of development rights specifically, mm -hmm. and then after that I'll go into open space. So um, uh, from the data that we were able to access from 2001, it seems as though there have been four um, business light industrial or industrial developments in Hatfield that are in the sending district for the transfer of development rights bylaw. So in the bylaw, any area that's zoned as business, light industrial or industrial is the sending district. However, there is also um, a uh, caveat um, where the uh, planning board will refuse, is how it's worded in the bylaw, um, any uh, application for transfer of development rights to a sending district that is not served by town sewer. So right away, that limits this, well, it, this, everything here that's this light purple, uh, light purple, darker purple, and um, salmonish pink, not, not over here, which is town center, but the slightly darker pink, um, that could all be potentially sending district, but because it has to be served by town sewer, that limits it to this area right here, mm -hmm. and then um, this area here, and right here. Um, and it eliminates the possibility of using uh, transfer of development <coughs> rights, sending it to any of this district up here. So um, whether or not uh, that was by design, I don't know. Um, I know Pioneer Valley Planning Commission worked on this with you. However, um, I believe that was Chris Curtis, who's no longer with us. So, um, so that <laughs> you make it sound yes, like he died. So, so that's something we might want to revisit, um, especially given that uh, development trends are already low um, in Hatfield. If we want to encourage the purpose of the bylaw to preserve open space and agricultural lands in everywhere that's not the sending district, or the receiving district. Um, so if, if we want developers to be taking advantage of that, that might be something to consider. Um, is, is it necessary that there's town sewer? Are there other, um, can we work That's the lady right behind you. <laughs> is it I'll necessary? Talk to you after. <laughs> that would, open, you that would open that up <laughs> like a, boom. I mean, it, it would go crazy. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, was, um, I was actually on the uh, master plan committee at the time and, uh, that we worked on this with Chris and actually uh, promoted this pretty heavily because uh, Hadley had a TDR ordinance at the time. And the thing I liked about 
what Hadley did and what Chris and we came up with here was um, that the, you know, as you well know, uh, but maybe the board members uh, not so well, typically in a transfer of development rights, you're, you're actually increasing, it's often done around residential, you're getting at residential bonuses, whereas we were looking more at sort of light industrial commercial because it wouldn't add to the schools and wouldn't add to otherwise the cost of community services associated with residential units. So the idea was that you could buy development rights or you could use development rights to actually increase your square footage or your height of your building or your lot coverage. So it would be on site for the most part. So it wouldn't change necessarily to the person driving by, they wouldn't notice necessarily that that building that now houses a bunch of books is a little bigger than maybe it would have been allowed right. because they actually put money into uh, buying development rights or putting money into a conservation fund that we could use to buy development rights or APRs on properties in town. Um, I guess it slipped my mind that we limited it to just areas that were sewer and water. Um, mm -hmm. Presumably that was thinking uh, from the environmental impact of adding additional roof, lot, roof coverage or height or lot coverage. but would certainly seem, but even without, uh, you know, even if we were to allow for um, those provisions, allow for, for example, uh, anywhere where you don't have sewer and water, as we are finding on other, there's other limitations to putting anything on those yes. properties in the first place, yeah. regardless of whether or not you could uh, get a bigger building or a, a greater lot coverage just because of all the wetlands and right. the, uh, streams and such. Yeah, so on the next page, we talk about barriers to, um, to making use of the transfer of development rights bylaw, and, mm. and that's actually one thing um, that we have uh, come across both, in term, both from speaking with um, developers, but also um, taking a look at existing conditions on site via GIS. Um, much of the corridor along routes 5 and 10, as I'm sure you're all aware, is uh, wetlands to the right and to the left, or to the east and to the west, but also um, we come into some issues of uh, suit suitable soils and slopes, I believe, on the west. So um, if, if the sewer and water, or if sewer were not an issue with this bylaw, um, it, there might be a question of if it would be worthwhile for a developer to take advantage of the increase in building coverage on any particular lot, um, given uh, or if they could build a septic, so those are two different those are two different um, issues. But uh, given existing conditions on any one particular parcel, so um, one uh, one thing that we're suggesting as a next step here is to um, uh, well is to reconsider if. Uh, the town sewer and water um, is necessary, and um, also, and it, you you will see in your pack the packets that I gave you. We have the same map here, which um, it came out a little grainy in this one. So the final report, I'll make sure that that's less grainy. But then I also included just a screenshot of uh, Mass GIS wetlands, so you can flip back and forth and compare to where they are, um, compared to where the sending districts are, or the receiving uh, areas are. Um, so the next step that we're recommending beyond that is to determine the development capabilities of the sending area um, by performing a developable land analysis. And so uh, by that we mean quantifying the total amount of developable land that exists on these parcels um, that contains buildable slopes, buildable soils, um, percolating soils, and access in this in existing in the existing bylaw to public sewer and water, and we'll see how limiting that is. If it's possible, given um, given current development, if it's even if there's even that much more opportunity here. Um, so. And that's um, uh, existing public water and sewer, as yes. opposed to anticipated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And right, and so that that would also be something to right. look at when when you do this analysis. Um, so um, from there, so that's, that's uh, barriers that developers face when they consider using the transfer of development rights. Something that I didn't actually include in this, um, 
but that we did hear from uh, the two developers mm -hmm. that I had conversations was, with was that uh, the TDR um, bylaw was maybe not that heavily publicized. So um, I believe Erica knew mm -hmm. about it, or that it exists. Mm -hmm existed, but the other developer hadn't heard of it. And he, he's doing more residential hmm. properties anyway. Um, but that's just something to consider. So then... Um, I will say that the one time that we were approached about it, it wasn't the plan. Actually, they called me because they thought I might know something about it. It was actually the food bank. And the food bank wanted to get a bigger coverage on their site. Um, <clears throat> but the ordinance wasn't going to work for them because the way it's written is you pay into a conservation fund based on what would be considered the current going rate for a development right. And David Sharkin, who was the director of the food bank at the time, actually wanted to have somebody donate an acre or the required acreage uh, oh. that could then that give them. That would be the, would transfer, be the transfer, would actually be a piece of parcel of property as opposed to paying into the fund, which then, like Hadley, would be used for future APRs or whatever. Right. And so, so when I... TDR, that's how TDRs are originally Oh, yeah, yeah. The, payment, right. Exactly yeah. right, exactly. And, and we wanted to avoid the fact that you'd have to go out and negotiate with an individual farmer and then also where is that acre and is it really appropriate conservation as opposed to putting it into... Now that the state requires a match for your APR, this would be a good way to fund that. And that is a question that um, that, that I sort of detail scenarios mm -hmm. for in, in the report that we won't go into that much detail yeah. about tonight. But if there are, um, and that's moving into the next session, which is obscurities in the bylaw. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, if if there's a scenario where a developer already owns residential land and they want to use the development rights on that residential land and transfer that to commercial land that they also uh, own or light industrial is that possible or does this have to be money that is going directly into this fund um, and then the planning board of the conservation commission or who uh, I'm not remembering who controls it was the that. conservation commission right. would control the fund but. yeah so so those are things that we so allow us to right. actually have the flexibility perhaps if someone were to come forward or in this case if the food bank did find a donor who was willing to donate easements on, you know, however many acres, and they could use that yeah, for their... And on the flip side, then what would there be to stop a developer from buying lots of wetlanded sites um, that don't have a lot of development potential anyway, that are zoned place. residential, right. and, and getting cheap development rights to then build out mm -hmm. valuable commercial land. Right. So, so those are just things to consider when we're moving forward and, and asking questions about what incentives are and what would make it easier for developers to um, use this. So um, talking about incentives, uh, one thing that I've found is that um, Underlying zoning in, in much of Hatfield's residential properties the, in the sending districts is one acre. Um, and uh, the TDR bylaw allows um, the parcels to be reduced to about half of that size, to about half an acre. However, in the bylaw, it's stated that uh, that's allowable as long as density does not exceed what would be allowed under I'm sorry, I moved into open space. Yeah, I was going to say, because our TDR is <laughs> yes, totally, li yeah, totally yeah. <laughs> limited to commercial. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so, uh, all right, so we talked about um, the obscurity, that particular obscurity. So um, the main question about in uh, appropriate incentives in TDR is, is what, allow what is allowed by right in commercial light industrial and industrial enough for most developers where they don't need the additional 5,000 square feet or a 3% increase in impervious cover. Um, so it's not actually, it's making it, if they were to try and take advantage of TDR, it would be added costs for not much more gain. Right. And that depends on what they're using the property for, of course. Um, yeah. In Hadley, one of the things that makes Hadley so, uh, uh, successful is that in addition to having incentives, there's also disincentives to not using TDR. They have a very onerous parking 
uh, requirements. Right. So if a developer takes advantage of TDR, they can reduce this onerous parking requirement, which would otherwise be almost unreasonable, in addition to the fact that they can then increase their um, uh, building coverage on site. So Hatfield has the incentive you can increase by X percent given where you are, um, but there's no, uh, there's the carrot, but there's no stick. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, <clears throat> from, from my research, and it seems like also from Larry's experience um, with this, it seems like the most successful TDR bylaws across the state, and th there aren't that many, but the, the ones that are <laughs> most successful do have the stick as well. I think you can say the one <laughs> that is successful yeah, I, I forget is the... Hadley's. Mm -hmm. um, there are others across the state, none have performed nearly, either they haven't performed at all, uh, we have a similar one to yours that we had in Westfield. We ran into the same problems. Uh, but Hadley's is, terribly, is wonderfully successful. But it's due to the fact that they do have that, that, that one requirement uh, that is a good incentive for a developer to take advantage of, and it's worth their while to take it. It's cost effective for them to take advantage right, of it. Right. Um, and well, yours, and, and the, the problem you sort of have is your regular. Um, regulations and requirements are very reasonable. Yeah. And right. And so we were building off of what was already there. The yeah. feeling was is that we couldn't change what was the there. Problem. Yeah, how do you change that? So we inherit a horrible yeah. owner's bylaw. Yeah. It's a yeah. huge plus. But you're never going to be able to impose that after the fact. Right. So the one <clears throat> way that we could, and I don't want this to sound like we're imposing a hardship, but if you get an additional uh, in, if we get additional infrastructure in town, say we were to get additional sewer and water, it's how you then open up those areas that are newly sewered and watered. And that's where you can perhaps put in some requirements that you know, you're, gonna, you, you're not going to be able to actually maybe take full advantage of the sewer and water. Or if you were to take advantage of it, you have to do X, Y, and Z. So there's some additional. So are you going to do that through your sewer tie-in? program? Well, are you going to try to do that through zoning? Well, so that's, I mean, that, I mean, I know there's talk about, you know, maybe a grant for additional sewer. Right. So what does that mean on Route 5 and 10? And how do you open that up? And because all of a sudden there's properties that right now are undeveloperable. Right. That are going to be. We have much of that land already zoned. Zoned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For industrial or yeah, exactly. light industrial. It's zoned, right. It's zoned, or, well, some of it is residential, so, too. So it's a matter of how do you go in after the fact and create the... Well, standard. because if you, because, because some of the building requirements that we have now may be totally reasonable for what you can do on that property now, but if it's sewered, you could, you could put in more. I guess what, what I would suggest is maybe just consider not limiting it to just commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, and allow it to extend to residential developments as well, as well with, with density bonuses and the like. Um, Which you might find something. you have a, a little bit better potential there. Well, you wouldn't necessarily have to require rezoning if it was a, if you would change the TDR provisions. Which then, if you have zoning where right now you allow, say, you know, they're one-acre lots, and you. <clears throat> if you want to develop a subdivision or something like that and get smaller lots, right. you require transfer development rights in order to do that. Well, that's like that guy that came in from the Cape that wanted to do that, right? Yep, the guy that, that, that came. guy that came in from the Cape that wanted to do that. Right. Build, you know, 12 or 14 houses on a piece of land that would only qualify for five or six. More, more like a new town development. Yeah. But that, if, if you can overcome the, you know, whatever environmental constraints there might be on that parcel, Go for it. But then you're overblowing the sewer situation. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, well, it's, 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 it depends whether you want it serviced by sewer or not. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. whether you can have it accommodated with on site. Well, let's put it this way. If, if, you're gonna, if you're going to sewer an area that isn't sewered now and you keep the zoning at one acre, then um, you're really not taking advantage of the sewer in the sense, that, and you shouldn't just give it away either, but you're not really taking advantage of the fact that all of a sudden this is not on-site septic anymore. Yeah. I mean, you've got the opportunity to use a sewer line for it, but you don't want to also just give it away either. 
Yeah. So there's the opportunity here to maybe use it to protect some farmland and open space and maybe also affordable housing density bonuses as well. And I think you also would like to look at, you know, what is your treatment capacity at your plant mm -hmm. and how best, how best, what's, what's the best way to utilize that limited capacity that you have? Yeah. I will do you say, want it, do you want it taken up with residential development, or do you want it commercial? Take the commercial right. job creating tax base expanding. Right. right. And I've spoken with Anthony at the water department just to try and get a feel for what your capacity for sewer and water is. And sort of his takeaway is that the town is basically at its limits on its DEP permit for pulling water. Yeah. So you either need to people can't tie into the water system or a new permit, which is quite costly. And in terms of sewer, there's capacity in the pipes, but the water treatment plant does not have capacity to process yeah, we're almost much at the, more yeah, sewer. Yeah, we're almost at the end out there. So yeah, it's, it's like, a problem. So it would seem like any <laughs> extension of the sewer line on Route 5 and 10 is going to have to address the capacity at the plant. I mean, if you just uh, run more down there, how are you gonna, how are you gonna build it's just going to end up in the Connecticut plant. River during a rainstorm. <laughs> 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 Right. People are going to say, well, what's you happening need a to my taxes space. now? Yeah, right. yeah, right. I don't think you have the elevation to get to. Well, yeah, but still, if, no matter how you get it there, if the, if the, if the treatment facility can't handle yeah. more, yeah. then. Yeah. There are lots of pieces to the puzzle. Yeah, exactly. right. I think we should put a second story on Hatfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just put a second story on top and just yeah. go out from here. <laughs> To, uh, and this I, I didn't talk about previously, but um, there's also a question, and I'm sure, Bob, that you are aware of how this number came to be, but to, to determine if the cash value of the, de of the development right um, and the corresponding bonus in allowable square footage or building coverage in the receiving area um, really match. Yeah. And so were those determined by a, a professional real estate professional? professional or um so at the time i think um we'd have to ask chris but my guess was that it was based maybe somewhat on what hadley was doing in terms of the formula that they were using at the time mm -hmm. um and it wasn't necessarily connected with is this commensurate with what you're getting in the additional building you know right. for the additional coverage I, I i'm reasonably certain that kind of you know, because really doesn't have that. I mean, it's, you're paying X amount of dollars for the parking. Right. And it's going into that fund. Right. And then that fund is spent by the commission on whatever they do. Yeah, so they're retiring parking spaces yeah. for X amount. Exactly. And so, yeah, so I don't think we actually were in a position, um, given the funding we had and other things, to really come up with how much is this additional lot coverage or um, building uh, size worth to you, and so then it was a de then it was like okay, so how much would you how would you determine the value of an easement basically the value of an APR, mm -hmm. and um, and then that would be the cost of your you know one for one or whatever I can't remember exactly what the formula was, but it it was one development right for certain percentage of increase in coverage. So, yeah, but, I, but as we looked at that, I'm not sure. It's cost effective for a developer to, to take advantage, to of, take it. advantage yeah. of it. Yeah. Right. Well, and in the case of the food bank, if they could get someone to donate it, then they were fine. But if they had to pay for it, exactly. it wasn't worth it. So they didn't do it. That's always the way. Yeah. So, so whether or not the next step there is to actually perform that economic valuation mm -hmm. or if it's to determine actually we're doing what we want to be doing despite mm -hmm. you know the econ what economic valuation might tell us, that, that's the next step is to just make sure that that is what we want it to be. Um, and then uh, reevaluate the incentives there and making, making sure that if it's really a goal to have developers be preserving agricultural and residential land, um, that we're making it as easy as possible for them to do that. And that might involve um, bringing in residential uh, sending areas. Um, and so the last, uh, the last suggestion that we're making is to remove obscurities in the bylaw. And I, I won't go through those in detail, but I'll just say that I think that the, the bylaw itself would really benefit from a definitions page. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a development right uh, definition changes depending on which municipality or community is, has a bylaw, and it's, it's never actually explicitly defined. 
the, the economic value of it, the cash value of it is defined, but not uh, what a development right is. So as a reader, I'm not sure if a development right, if there's just one development right per parcel that I'm preserving, or if that parcel is subdividable, if there's like five development rights on that on that whole parcel, mm -hmm. because there's five buildable lots, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that type of thing would make it uh, uh, you know, much easier. Um, and then I, uh, on page seven, you'll see that I, I've called out specific sections in the bylaw that I have questions about. Um, and those might either be open-ended questions for your consideration, or they might be actually just technically what is trying to be said here. Okay. Um, so those, those should be addressed. Um, so moving forward into open space development. So again, starting with determining appropriate incentives. As I was saying, a residential uh, lot in much of Hatfield is one acre zoning. And the open space development bylaw allows for um, uh, a reduction to a half, about a half acre zoning. Um, however, there's also a provision in the bylaw um, that says, uh, provided that the overall density of the development is not greater than what is normally allowed in the district. So by disallowing increased density with open space development, there becomes a question of uh, beyond clustering towards uh, road or utility, um, what is the incentive? And maybe that's enough in, in particular areas but um, what I have been seeing in model bylaws and in case studies is that um, increasing the density overall is what is the largest draw to developers. So if it, if it is one acre or two acre zoning, if all of a sudden, if it's attached to town sewer, so, that, so this would be feasible, town sewer and water, we say actually now this is a quarter acre zoning and because of the design um, regulations that we've incorporated into this bylaw, there's uh, vegetative screening from the road, et cetera. So there, it will still have the appearance, the appearance of being lower density. Um, now I can get in twice the number of units that I could have previously. And then that's a real incentive to developers. So that's one thing to consider. I don't, I don't know if you have insight as to why it was written that way or if that came from... Um, well, this was, um, again, it was, um, you know, uh, actually, if I remember correctly, um, we had been talking about something like this, and Catherine Rattay also was working with us at the time, and they uh, said, well, why don't we have some language we can suggest? And so we, we sort of went with what was given to us by the commission at the time. Okay, well, I'll definitely, I did yeah. not know she worked on this. Yeah. I'll ask her about that. Um, uh, so, um, I, I, on the rest of that page, I, I go into sort of like a, there's a, a lot of number crunching there, so mm -hmm. to illustrate the point, um, which I, I won't say aloud because I, this can be hard to follow, but basically the conclusion that I come to is, you know, if the concern here, the reason that we're only reducing to half an acre zoning, if the concern is either because of, uh, septic and well water um, contamination concerns, or the concern is the appearance of higher density when, when we would prefer to have a uh, more rural aesthetic, um, that there's the possibility of uh, further subdividing this bylaw into different zones and saying, um, you know, in town center uh, where there is sewer and water and where it's a little bit um, more dense looking anyway, and we have, um, mixed use overlay districts there, et cetera, uh, what we could reduce from half acre zoning to quarter acre zoning. But then further out, and uh, I believe it's outlying residential, um, if uh, in areas that either aren't tied into sewer or um, where you would you know, really want to make sure that it still looks rolling and um, rural, then you can keep the existing bylaw. So there's just a lot, or, or you could, change the whole bylaw and go to allowing uh, where it works, um, given the soils and the public utilities, you know, go to, to small, allowable, allowing greater density than the underlying zoning. So those are things to consider. Um, One of the challenges we did have, and I do remember now, because um, we were talking about doing something, just as you said, that would otherwise sort of 
emulate the existing building pattern in, in town. It's sort of interesting that you talked about town center being dense because there are a lot of small lots uh, from, you know, certainly uh, maybe somewhere between the middle, uh, you know, halfway between where it's Elm Street and Maple Street and then Main Street that would not be allowable lots today. I mean, there's a lot that have, you know, they don't have 200 feet of frontage and they're not a full, you know, acre or whatever. And, um, and when we suggested that we would allow something similar to that to happen in the future, the reaction was dramatic in opposition. In opposition. The feeling was is that town center is really big and broad and there's big houses and all that. And when we tried to point out, yeah, but many of them are on really small lots, um, there was not a whole lot of appetite for um, allowing the more of a, uh, you know, further dense style, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. New England village development, particularly to take advantage of the sewer and water. Um, uh, it was in, uh, so we were meeting in the late 90s and then it was 2002. It is a while ago, but I but many of the people that came for those meetings in opposition are still still alive. Still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem you have is that you, as you drive around Hatfield, it's beautiful. Right. You've got yeah. vast expanses right. of undeveloped land, yeah. and yeah. it's hard to stomach. Right. You know something happening there like that. Right. But I bet um, if you called but, it accessory apartments and allowed each yeah. of those to do that, people would do it right away. Well, I think and one of wouldn't call it density. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's the issue is, is that we always have this impression that density means, uh, you know, means uh, substandard housing, which is sad because um, it can be done in a way in which um, it actually is uh, very attractive, whether that's through screening or just architectural design. But density also means, is interpreted as being more people and right. more yeah. kids. Right, yeah. Um, which we need. Which, which yeah. your particular case with a school that's uh, yeah. uh, wanting right. uh, for kids, that may not be the worst now, thing. I'm not suggesting that we not try again. It's just that when we tried in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was sort of interesting because when we were pointing out to people that there were a lot of houses along Elm Street and right. that, you know, where people think, well, this is what we think of Hatfield, we're like, well, we'd like to have more of that. We're like, well, we don't want it because those are too, right. you know, the thought was that those. But if you're doing an open space development, mm -hmm. that's not the kind of development you're going to be getting. Right. You're going to be getting an open space development, which has its other attributes. Right. Right. Uh, straining from the road. Exactly. Right. Which is written and pr lot. preservation of open space yeah. and, uh, you know, combining. Uh, areas to make larger areas mm -hmm. yeah. um, that and I think are so. And so the, the other um, next steps to consider here are that, uh, again, from model bylaws and from research and case studies, what I'm seeing is, is that The most successful open space development bylaws are those which have become not only by right, but the standard subdivision. And, and what we think of as standard subdivision now has become the special permit or, or the alternative. So in the event that you can prove that standard subdivision uh, would be better suited for a particular site or um, would, you know, better... Uh, there's maybe environmental resources or something like that. I, I don't know how that would work, but you know, there's some something happening on site where a standard subdivision would be better suited, and you can prove that to the planning board. Um, then uh, that's allowable, but otherwise, open space development, as it's written in the bylaw, is how you expect you it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So the Levitt Town is becomes the exception to the rule as opposed to it now being the way you do it. Right. And the and the open space development being some creative alternative. And I think yeah. it should be noted that that's one of the the strategies in your housing production plan mm -hmm. was moving to the open space development being the buy right option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it appears again. Which actually <laughs> would be in. <clears throat> would be more in keeping with the history and tradition of Hatfield yeah. um, than just plunking a big, you know, sort of traditional 
suburban subdivision. Yeah. And, and that's what it looks like, right. suburbia. Right, right. And then also, too, I'd just like to say, yeah. like, if we were saying land is some of the largest cost mm -hmm. for in Hatfield, it's just trying to get first-time home buyers to buy a smaller, being able to build on a smaller parcel of land would be much more affordable and able to bring in younger families, hopefully, to town. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and, you know, as it's currently written, you, would, you could still, as, as long as the... Um, site plan worked out, you could still get the existing uh, de allowable density, so so developers wouldn't necessarily be losing mm -hmm. number of units from, from doing that, from moving in that direction. So those are the two next steps identified there uh, in um, identifying appropriate incentives. And so the last thing is um, identifying obscurities in, in this bylaw, and again, or removing obscurities, and so again, it could benefit from some definitions. I, I think it's more, the language used in here is more clear than transfer of development rights in general, um, but always helpful. And then um, on the last, you know, pages eight and nine, um, I go into, again, specific language that, that could be clarified, which I won't read out loud here. Um, the, only th the only other thing I'll say is that uh, in the purposes section of the bylaw, there's the opportunity there to um, include a few more purposes, which are either you know stated in the bylaw later on, or that you know we know that you um, have as uh, as town values based off of um, the master plan or open space and recreation plan, et cetera. So making those explicit in here um, would be powerful. So. Um I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'll spend some time going through these and I hope the other board members will and come up with some thoughts. But would our next step then be to uh, work with you in a more roll up the sleeves way to sort of come up with some of these definitions and additional language or changes for both of these bylaws? Larry and I were speaking about this before. Yeah, you know, what you need to do is apply for a DLTA grant from us or some, or, or, uh, some local technical assistance or something like that, uh, or another UPWP. Okay, so that's a lot of, I'm, I'm used to having worked with acronyms, but you just threw a whole bunch of me that I'm unfamiliar okay. with. So. Local technical assistance, LTA. Yeah. Uh, district local technical assistance, DLTA, UPWP. Unified, Unified planning, planning work, work plan. Program. Okay. And they're from different funding sources, and they're for different amounts of dollars. And for us, dollars translate to hours. Okay. And who helps us navigate through the application process? The, the open... applications are relatively easy. Whenever we send out a request for proposals, we send it to the select board, we send it to the planning board. Okay. So, so is there another is round a... coming up? Yep. Yeah. And this was a UPW. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And right. they usually come yeah. out in the fall. Uh, early winter, yeah. late fall. So since we did the first one, which was really just sort of a preliminary, can you take a look at these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can be more specific in this next round as to exactly what it is we want to then use the additional funding for. Yeah. And Larry can speak to this more, but I, 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 I'm new to these programs, mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering, since I'm working with UPWP for this particular project, and it had relatively few hours compared to Ashley's DLTA mm -hmm. project, is that <coughs> always the case for UPWP? Yes, so much so. yes okay. very much so. There's, there's yeah. a bigger pot of money for DLTA, and then the uh, way it goes is there's a bigger pot of money for DLTA, smaller amount for UPWP, and a really tiny amount <laughs> for local, te local technical oh, assistance. Okay. 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 Uh, but you are <clears throat> entitled to uh, 21 hours of free technical assistance every year. And uh, you mean the planning board or the town? The town, the town. can request it. Yeah, and, we're and you can request it for multiple things. Uh, and you know you, we're good as long as we still have those hours available. And Marlene, is that fast. something that we do through you so that you don't have multiple people like <laughs> hitting them up for those 20 minutes? Yeah. I addressed a letter to Tim. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's how it works. Okay. <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, but just to, to wrap up, the, the big thing you need to do is when you look at these two, it's got to make economic sense to the developer to take advantage of it. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, so you're, although so you're, off, at so you're some, often not looking for a wash. Right, but at you some point, but at, but at some point, just 
being able to do business in Hatfield might be an economic benefit, right? I mean, Northampton's filling up. We, we offer a product that is not available in many other places right around here yeah, anymore. That's true. We uh, offer a unique product. And <laughs> yeah, no, I know that. I know we've there. I know, I, no, I know there's a lot of limitations, but we're, you know, we're, we're pretty close and, well, we're obviously directly adjacent to Northampton. Um, so you've been adjacent to Northampton for a long time. No, but Northampton is. Northampton back in the 80s yeah. when they went to the bull. And you I were adjacent then? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you know, that was boom time. Okay? And, uh, <laughs> well, but also. It's it almost like this uh, cloak of invisibility. You yeah. Know, use what I mean. At the border. People well, but there's like a Star Trek thing, reference. That, but there's another thing to keep in mind, and that is that, you know, the, one of the reasons why there hasn't been as much development in Hatfield is because. Farming is actually doing pretty yeah. well in Hatfield. And so there isn't a desire for a mass sell-off. And, you know, Paul is right. A lot of this land is held by a number, by a small number of uh, very active uh, farm families. Um, so how their future goes, so goes Hatfield's. Right. But right now, I mean, you know, every year is different. And this year wasn't a great one, but farming is actually pretty robust right. in the valley, and so... But as you know, yeah. as I know, yeah. and like farmers that I've dealt with, it's a hard job. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard job, and most of their kids are lawyers and doctors and accountants. Well, that's one of the things that is maybe a little different in Hatfield. There's yeah. a couple, there's a number of families that are into now, I can think of one off the top of my head that's into its third generation on the farm, and the other one that's into the, there's two generations on the farm. Mm -hmm. There's two at least that have two generations operating. There's one that's got three. Right. What did Belden say the other day? How many generations have been operating well, Belden Farm? Well, they've, they've had 13 on that farm. Yeah, 13 but different but generations. There's two gener but there's two generations operating on that farm right now. Right now, yeah. Right now. Right. But also other towns, our surrounding towns have had much more increase in diversification of their farms and have, have not seen that. So. Yeah. Right, because of the, of the, uh, the strength of these of these particular farm families that are in the operations that they're in. So, but well, if that, you want to rely on the yeah. fine attributes of Hatfield um, as a trade-off for developers not to make as much money as they could otherwise, uh, I think that's terrific. But I would think about <laughs> yeah. just making sure, you know, that you just think about this. No, this, I know. This is a business. Well, that's my, uh, that's my point, is that if Hatfield is attractive, we don't have to just give it away. Correct. But it's been attractive. Yeah. For okay. yeah. And we haven't given it away. A long time. And you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And that's why we're having this conversation today. That's right. Right. Okay. How is it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I think similar to Corinne, I've spent a couple of months. I met with you before the summer started mm -hmm. to sort of kick things off. I spent a couple of months digging into what some of the perceived issues might be as to why this density bonus isn't getting used. Um, I'm guessing you're all familiar with the density bonus. I don't have to well, the, quick overview. Yeah, just because okay. Rick is new and yeah, it's been a while, it yeah, hasn't been used. Yeah, so you have um, a couple of sections of mixed use zoning. So the section here, this is not angled well to you. Well, that's okay, it's good for the camera. So section here, a section up here, so it's where this hat, hatching is. Mm -hmm. A section here, and a section here is a school. I think that's a school, a school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And so in those sections, there is, you can do mixed use, um, commercial under residential. Um, the affordable housing density suggests that if 10% of the units in the residential structure um, are affordable to 80% of the area median income, um, which would qualify for your chapter, your 40B um, count, that you can get an additional 25% density bonus. Mm -hmm. So 10% of your units are affordable, you can build 25% more. It hasn't been taken advantage of. Um, some of the main issues, I think, sewer and water capacity. So the section 
all the way up to the north near the Waitley border doesn't have um, sewer access. Water. The others do. I do wonder about this capacity. So if you are building to a scale that makes providing these affordable units feasible, is there enough water capacity to pull to, to feed that building or sewer capacity to mm -hmm. treat the waste? So even if there is a tie-in, can they actually tie in? Um, to use the mixed-use overlay district, there are some extra zoning requirements. So it's a special permit, and you have to have a traffic study. Uh, I'm not saying that these are like the whole reason why people are just like absolutely not going to happen, but I think they add some uncertainty and time to the process. I understand why they're there. You want to get a good product. Um, so that could be a reason. Um, I think what's been the most interesting is the incompatible existing uses in some of the areas. So you think about places you would want to live. I don't know that some of these districts are places I would want to live. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look, um, we'll skip this other towns. I've reviewed what towns that you all said you might be comparable to mm -hmm. yep. um, to see what they had, but we can revisit that. Um, existing land uses of the parcels in the mixed use development district. When you look at the nice uh, pie chart, you're seeing like, oh, not too bad. 32% residential, 34% commercial. When you start to look at each node individually, you realize that some of them just aren't um, conducive. So when we look at the sections near the river in the town center, most of the parcels that are zoned are governmental uses, so your town hall, your library, your fire station. The affordable density bonus isn't being used there because it's mm. building you all own. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the rhyme or reason for designating those parcels was. Was there a thought that at some <laughs> point they will become vacant and this might provide the most flexible reuse for it? Yeah, so Paul, you were... Um, I was just getting on the planning board when uh, Chris Curtis was working yeah. with the board on um, this mixed-use development. And so I don't know. I mean, when I look at this, I mean, even the one on Billings Road, the one developable piece is actually owned by the town, and it's, yeah. and it's, and it's actually designated for um, either cemetery, cemetery. Exp cemetery expansion yeah, or fields cemetery or... Expansion. or there you go. Community, go community garden yeah. plots. <laughs> Smaller so, plots, but certainly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not, I think that maybe there was some hesitancy about where to put these, and so it, it sort of I got to remember, where there were already. Okay. This one is an outlier, but some of the other ones are where there already are these sort of mm -hmm. mashups of, of uses from, from historical um, land use patterns in town, you know? And it's a private road, too. You'd have to yeah, get some right. kind of special. Yeah. Um, the next one is a note that's close to the river. Where is that one? It's near your town center. I think this one is the most conducive. You've got a good mix, commercial, residential. Um, the one developable parcel, <laughs> in terms of it not having a structure or a use on it right now, um, isn't actually developable because it doesn't meet the minimum lot size for the mixed-use zoning district. So that one is sort of X'd out. So it would be whether or not I think maybe what Chris was thinking of is that while these are what they are, they could be something else. Right, they could yeah. come in. But so I'm just looking right. at like if we're just, everything's on the ground as is today. Right, I mean, you know, like the, the old Hatfield Market, I mean, that's been vacant for a Several couple years. of years now. More than I mean, now. someone maybe could buy that property, level it, and do a mixed use. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we have in Hatfield is we haven't had many scrape offs, right? I mean, no, so people no, very think that, cool. well, it's always going to be a, you know, a gas, you know, a, uh, an auto repair shop. Well, you know, maybe it won't always be an auto repair shop. And in this case, maybe it won't always be at Hatfield Market. It'll well, be Hatfield Market coming soon. Haven't you seen yeah. the sign? Somebody has gone in there and, oh. and they're rehabbing it's, it. They're rehabbing it. Okay. So Isn't but now we're going to get another market. Apartment Still going to be there, two so apartments in a market. No, five apartments. o'clock, maybe I can make coffee there. Right? But so, I mean, I, I think the point was yeah. these are potential places where maybe they're uh, underutilized or they're, um, you know, they could be redeveloped or whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, the two nodes on five and 10 are sort of 
the ones that I think are a bit more incompatible. Right. Yep. Um, I think it's important to note, so Corinne has talked about the TDR receiving district. Um, so the, the areas where you're sending your increased density potentially for commercial and industrial mm -hmm. is also where you're wanting mixed use residential mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. um, do people want to live next to light industrial? Or industrial? Or industrial. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> um, the parcel north up to the Waitley border I think has less issues. It's mainly commercial um, and residential and then uh, has a developable parcel. The parcel to the south, which is the one that has your access to sewer and water near the Northampton line, um, has a lot of industrial parcels and um, commercial like truck sales. So not like a, a grocery store. Yeah, right. Um, and then the two parcels in there that are developable if we're using the the notion that it's vacant right now and someone could go in. One doesn't meet the minimum frontage requirements and the other doesn't meet the minimum lot size. So of your five vacant parcels mm -hmm. in the whole district, only right. two of them are actually developable and one is uh, cemetery extension. Yeah. Yeah, so so I'm, not, I'm, not got one. I'm not sure how much of this was, this kind of analysis was done when this was being proposed. Oh, I don't think um, I don't remember. I don't, I, don't think, I don't remember this. And it, again, I came. Uh, I was coming. I think they were the based board. upon what was there <laughs> previously, like the like yeah. in North Hatfield, or yeah. or what was across the across the street here. Uh, yeah. So more like the idea that okay, these are already sort of mixed use areas, mm -hmm. so they could continue to be mixed right. use areas and redeveloped with yeah. under this zoning. Yeah. And actually, interestingly enough, I think the one property that doesn't meet the minimum lot size. That's, that's now in. Um, uh, or in, uh, the minimum frontage is actually being protected. Oh. So the one that you had is now a goose egg. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, and for good reason. So yeah. a lot of wetlands in that area. And so. Um, I already talked a little bit about the conflict with other zoning bylaws. When you look at other towns, so I think it was Waitley, Southampton, Granby, Belchertown, Southwick, mm -hmm. and Hadley. And in your packet, you're going to see um, a data table that will have sort of population trends, housing trends, affordable housing units for each town and then looking at whether or not they have a density bonus or an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, the other towns that had a incentive-based affordable housing density bonus, um, Waitley, I don't think it's even worth um, talking about that because the way that they're managing growth in Waitley is so different. They put a cap on 10 building permits a year and then the, the density bonus goes off of you can get extra building permits, which is just isn't the case here. So I don't think it's it's replicable. I'm not sure that's legal. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, Southampton has a inclusionary zoning bylaw that mandates affordable units above uh, developments that have ten units, uh, and so their voluntary inclusionary bonus is for developments under the ten, and they have a lot of um, cost offsets, including a density bonus lower filing fees, waivers of certain dimensional requirements. So they provide a number of incentives, not just this increased density, um, that might help ease mm -hmm. um, the challenge. So I think we talk about, you know, there not being enough frontage. Under Southampton's bonuses, that's something that could be waived. Um, their inclusionary zoning bylaw was adopted in 2014 and hasn't been used yet. Um, mm -hmm. So similar to you all. Um, Granby has the exact same um, affordable housing density bonus as you in a mixed use zoning district. I think the thing that's a little bit different about Granby is theirs is um, centered in a node of existing commercial district uh, or development. It's five corners if you're familiar with that area. Yeah. 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 Um, so not a whole lot of industrial uses going on there. But they do have just about as much wetland surrounding it. <laughs> um. Um, and just like Southampton, it was adopted in 2014 and hasn't been used yet. Um, so. 
And so the second part of my, my work on this will actually be um, working with you all to change the bonus. I'm funded to do that. Um, so there's a couple of possible remedies. You could keep it as is and just wait to see if the market will bear this at some point. If you do that, there's a couple of things that I would recommend changing. Um, in the bylaw, there's a, a caveat about infill development. Um, so if you're building a building and it's infill, you can't use the affordable housing density bonus. I don't understand the rationale behind that. I don't know if you all know why that was included. Um, so I would recommend taking that out. And then the other thing is um, there's nothing in the bylaw stating that these affordable units should qualify for the subsidized housing inventory. I think if Hatfield is thinking about getting to its 10%, it's really important that yeah, that no. be called out. Yeah. yeah, that absolutely. I mean, I guess. Why you know, else? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, some of this is you know, sort of interesting because I think a lot of this was all sort of put together by the commission and um, we were, you know, working on the recommendations that were being made at the time. So, but yeah, I mean, it makes no sense for us at all to be doing anything that involves affordable housing if it doesn't, if it's not right. eligible for the, uh, for the, uh, yeah. the state, the state list. I agree. Yeah. Um, the other option you have for this is to keep the density bonus, but expand it to other zoning districts, mm -hmm. um, like the town center, for example. So instead of having it just in these mixed use pockets, um, potentially, I don't know what the, the feasibility or the appetite for that would be, but having this density bonus available in, you know, the town center or the town center business. Um, could be an option where you might have more developable land. Um, or if the town is going to pursue the inclusionary zoning bylaw, which I'll talk about next, mm -hmm. I think following Southampton's lead and sort of folding that in to say, we're going to mandate affordable housing units for developments over X number. Mm -hmm. If you're under this, you can still take advantage of these cost offsets if you provide right. this. And then it would be your density bonus would be tied into that and could be applicable in the zones where your your inclusionary zoning is mandated. Mm -hmm. So you've got sort of three options right. that I'll let you all mull over. Um, right. And then in terms of inclusionary zoning, I have less to talk about tonight. I'm going to need to come back. Um, in your folder that I gave you, I've included Hadley, Southampton, and Amherst's inclusionary zoning bylaw along with the state model. Um, can I give you homework? <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, that's, that's great. I appreciate that because this is one in particular that I talked to you all about and that I, in particular, and very interested in um, for a lot of reasons. One, if the goal is 10%, yep. then if you've got any development over a certain size and 10% of them have to be affordable, you're working towards your goal. Mm -hmm. And it assimilates the units into the, into the existing, not existing, but into that development as opposed to just saying, well, it's going to be over there, um, which I, I don't think works because it obviously works people have done it but i think it's exactly what people are concerned about mm -hmm. whereas if you assimilate it um to the yeah. to the person yeah. driving by they're the person there. walking by you're never going to know and in fact there's a good chance that you'll choose the wrong house as the one that the people that needed help living in yeah, I, are agree, in. I agree with that 100 yeah. yeah yeah and and i think it's interesting all towns are doing it differently um, Amherst requires, like you're talking about, that they be built into the development. Mm -hmm. Southampton and Hadley say it can be on-site, it can be off-site. You can pay us and we'll potentially build the unit down the road. Like they're doing with their TDR open space. Yeah, in, but it's, in, it's, no, it's, it's a worse alternative. Yeah. Yeah. From, my, uh, from my perspective, 
It's the worst alternative. Yeah, right, because you can just kick that can down the road. Well, you can kick it down the road, but also, how do you, you know, uh, this is a conversation we had. It's, the developer can create those units for less money than you can. Yeah. And so you're either going to have to require a increased dollar value mm -hmm. uh, to Make for your happen. for your development right. and suddenly just, you just skewed all the economics. Right. And mm -hmm. also then the town is in the in the business of Now it's your job to right. create it as right. opposed to his or right. her job. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Um, each of the three towns has different thresholds. So uh, Southampton and Amherst say if your unit is bigger than, if your development is bigger than 10 units, Hadley is at six. Um, I think it's interesting when we look at Hatfield's map, you've had one development that's been over eight units mm -hmm. in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So is 10 the right threshold? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and then they all have different threshold or different percentages of the units that must be affordable. Hadley's 15% must be affordable. Southampton is 10%. Amherst had to complicate things <laughs> and it's between 10 and 12% depending on the number of units. Um, and so I think if you can all familiarize yourself with the zoning bylaws, I've got a couple of key questions in here to consider. Um, should the inclusionary zoning be required for all developments, those in certain districts, those that need a special permit? There's like many flavors of inclusionary zoning. Um, what is the unit threshold? Is it that we're absolutely going to require them to build it? Do we want to take money? Um, and then what type of bonuses could we provide? Is it just this increased density? Or is it that we might waive some dimensional requirements? Um, and so I'm hoping to come back to you in October mm. to have a conversation and work through some of this. Okay. Yep. And you said in the package are those ordinances? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. That's great. Um, and did you include the mixed use development ordinances from the other towns too, or? I have uh, Southampton's is in with their inclusionary zoning bylaw. Okay, all right. Granby's is in there, although it reads exactly yeah. like yours. Granby's is. Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't print Waitley's because I just didn't feel it was Amherst. applicable at all. Okay. Um, and then I'm also going to need some guidance on where you want to go with this affordable density bonus. For uh, for the inclusionary zoning, or for yeah. So is it going to remain in the mixed use yeah. district, or are we tying it just into the inclusionary zoning? Right. Right. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk to you all about. Uh, this didn't print really well. I apologize. Um, PVPC has partnered with the Franklin Regional Council of Governments and the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, to hold an affordable housing trust roundtable. It's going to be October 18th in Amherst. Um, there's a couple of pieces. The later half of the event is for communities that already have a housing trust, so they can sort of brainstorm and mm -hmm. talk about challenges that they're all facing. The beginning part of the evening will be a tour of Butternut Farm, which is an affordable housing development in Amherst that kind of looks like farmhouses. It's kind of neat to see. Um, and then Mass Housing Partnership is going to be doing a presentation on what housing trusts are and how to start one in your community. Um, I think it's listed as something to do in your housing plan, and I've heard that there was some interest. So if anyone would like to attend, just let me know. So, um, Stephanie, does the housing committee, are you guys aware of this? I am the only person on the housing committee, okay. so we haven't really, I don't know how much I can do with just me. <laughs> well, um, so, However, I can, can probably do Can you, well, can, did you get a package? Yes. Yeah. Did you did? Yeah. Okay. And the, the community, pre, I'm the, uh, Ron and I are both on the community preservation committee. I'm the chair of that. And so we actually funded the housing production plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and this is something that we're, we're, because we can, a CPA can fund housing. Right, you housing. can send your housing yeah. set aside right, right. for there. Um, and uh, so I will not be able to make this, but I will uh, bring this up at the next Community Preservation Committee Great. meeting because I think we can maybe get John Wilkes or uh, John was on the committee with Paul yeah. uh, as a representative from the CPC, and, I, and he's very interested in these issues. So I think we, we can probably get someone in addition to hopefully one of 
someone here from the planning board to attend, if Stephanie can be there, and then maybe someone from CPC. Perfect. Yeah. If you just want to send me an email, I've uh, paper clipped my business card in your okay. packet okay. as well. Okay. All right. Um, so I have a account. There will also be a light dinner. I think it's going to be. So this easy. says for existing trustees, but you are actually, there is going to be this. Uh, so it's for existing trustees, staff about. that support the trust, and communities exploring. Exploring. Okay, great. Because I got a notice from. Uh, MHP uh, just uh, recently, and it was very clear that it was only for existing housing trust. It was uh, in Boston, no. so yeah. So, because yeah. I'm on their mailing, I'm on their email list. I've gone to a couple of their programs. When I had spoke with someone mm. at MHP, they wanted to do it for just existing trust. Yeah. I was like, we have a lot of communities right. that are actually interested in creating one, so can we expand, expand yeah. it to offer something for them as well? Great. So, okay. Terrific. I will be in touch. See you in October. All right. Good. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, we, I don't think, have any other business. Um, I will just note that um, uh, Mr. Cleveland, who has the storage buildings uh, for sale out by the Chowder House, uh, he is. Away. Uh, away and uh, unavailable until October, so I'm hoping that he'll be here for the October meeting. Um, you have in your file, which I'd like you to look at, the uh, correspondence that Kyle has had with Mr. Pekarski about the uh, property on Elm Street. This is the one that we talked about, referenced earlier. That oh, yeah, yeah, he's got the cars back there. And all that, yeah. I think unit. he also has um, something besides. Uh, uh, an illegal apartment there. Um, there's a number of vehicles that are not stored in that building, in, in excess of, I'd say, around 20. Uh, uh, on that property. Unregistered and. Unregistered. Uh, some are in disrepair, hulks. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion, I think they're running a. He's got an illegal junkyard there. Mm -hmm. um, on, in uh, September of 2014, uh, uh, I don't think. You guys were on the planning board, but uh, he came before us and requested uh, commercial storage of automobiles. And, and on our bylaws, 5.23, allows that in, uh, in sheds, barns, garages. The use was allowed. And we approved that by the planning board. He was going to use an existing barn for the storage. However, you go up there. <laughs> He's not, I don't know if there's, maybe there's cars in the barn. I didn't go in the barn, but there is, there's a junkyard up there, mm -hmm. plain and simple. And I'm, I'm going to talk to Kyle about it okay. uh, and let him know, uh, based upon the use, was we did not, in that meeting, uh, allow him to store cars in various really states. all over the place. In various yeah. states of disrepair outside the building. It was a storage, like... And, and a lot of these cars are not, what I, in my opinion, again, are not, you know, a classic 1955 Chevy or, a, you know, a, a 1929 Rolls Royce or anything like that. They're just, you know, Hondas and well, all kinds my, of cars. I was, uh, that, I was new to the planning board then, but I, I sort of remember him specifically <laughs> saying that he was going to be storing vintage vehicles. Yes, that this was in, going to in, be in the barn. In the barn, that this was both his and then maybe other clients right. that he was going to be storing, you know. But if you have vintage, costly vehicles, you don't store them in a tobacco barn. You have to get something better than that. Cause well, the right, but, but even that, still, that's what he was saying. Yeah, that's what he was telling out, you. But yeah. if they're outside and they're yeah. junks, then that's a totally That's a whole different thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, Kyle was also... Um, Continuing to, you know, keep us apprised of what's happening over here on Elm Street at the cotton wood processing uh, as to whether or not they're within what they had said they were going to be doing in terms of the size of that operation and its hours. And so he'll be keeping us on. Kyle had said that they were kind of quieting down a little bit. It huh? sounds like it is quieting down in terms of the volume of work that's going on there. I, I, I don't know if... Uh, uh, haven't heard of any additional issues in terms of being outside the hours that yeah. were allocated for the time that they could be handling their uh, doing their uh, splitting and processing. Um, so our next meeting is October 4th. 
Um, I will actually, um, and maybe I'll talk to Ashley. I'm not going to be able to be here for the meeting on the 4th, so I'm hoping, Paul, you can handle the chair. I am not going to be here either. You're not? No. Okay. So, I talked with Wilma this morning about moving it probably to the following Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilma was kind of iffy about it, but uh, that's the, my oh, normal my run to Maine, and I just, right. um, you know, I'm not going to change that at that point. And, um, well, I wouldn't be available on the 11th, but would the 11th work for the rest of the board? Um, maybe that even works then for Mr. Uh, uh, Car uh, Helena, but I don't know. Um, well, no, because Wilma needs 30 days for his, his notice. Um, I guess if we moved it to the 11th, the 11th, um, it might work that for my, my will, but I guess we'd have to talk to her about the, well, I wouldn't, frames. I wouldn't move it based solely on his, his needs because he's no. expecting to come in in November, but would the 11th work for, it uh, wouldn't work for me because I'm just gone for a couple of weeks, but would it work for, work for me, Ron? Mm -hmm. October yeah. 11th? Yeah, good. Every, October 11th is fine with me. We'll have four, is, four of us here. Yeah. We're here yeah. now. It just, like, we'll the fourth, let, I'm away. That's all, all right, right. so I'll, I'll let uh, Wilma know that we uh, prefer to have the meeting on the 11th. Okay. Okay. Good deal. So with that, can I get a motion to adjourn? Oh, you bet you believe it, you can. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. I adjourned about Thank half past eight.